Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen invites me on a date and brings two other dudes. Backstory. I, 24 male, met this girl, 23, Katie, at the gym. We clicked and hung out a few times over the past couple of months. Katie invited me out for a dinner at a fancy restaurant to talk about our relationship. Out of nowhere, she told me that her two friends were coming to the dinner. She doesn't have female friends. I then asked if I could bring a few friends for dinner too. I didn't want this to be a three-on-one thing. She agreed, but didn't seem happy about it. At the dinner, Katie brought two guys with her who were clearly into her. I had invited three friends, my best friend since childhood, his fiance, and my friend, Case, Juhi, and Yusung. Yusung came before us, but then had to leave even before we got seated. She invited him to join us at the gym since he clearly works out. He texted me later that she seemed nice, but the way she let the two guys grill me was weird. After he stepped out, we got seated, and Katie's friends said they had to leave even though they just ordered a ton of appetizers. Case and Juhi came in a little bit later, and Katie did this weird little laugh and said that it would be nice if people arrived on time, especially since half the people left. She seemed to only ask questions to Case, who shy around new people, and kept complimenting Juhi's jewelry and clothing, but in a really weird way. Katie told me she didn't realize I had so many Asian friends. At the dinner, she ordered two entrees and barely touched either of them, or the appetizers she and her friends ordered. She did get multiple drinks. She made a few jokes, like that I liked her because guys like girls who are one of the guys. When the bill came, it was way beyond my budget, and she said it should be split equally between me and Case. I said that it should be split between us, Katie and me, and them, Case and Juhi, based on what we ordered. Since they only had two entrees, and we had three entrees and a ton of appetizers, we should pay the bigger amount. I was fine splitting equally between Katie and me, but she started calling me a cheapskate for not offering to pay for her. I told her it wasn't my fault her friends ordered appetizers and then left. She said if I was willing to cover more of the bill without her approval, then I should be fine paying the entire thing. I told her that was dumb and I wasn't going to pay for things she ordered. Juhi offered to pay the bill. Katie said that that wasn't the problem and said I was accusing her of being a gold digger. I said the reason she's not like the other girls is because she's incredibly rude. That's why no girls want to be her friends. She stormed out of the restaurant. In the end, I paid for our entrees and appetizers, and Juhi paid for their part. I've been ignoring Katie's texts, but I want to know, am I the jerk? Karen tries to get me to give her son my PS5, Xbox, and my TV. I'm about 20 years old, never ask a lady her true age, and I am autistic. I'm high-functioning and that I can type and play video games very well, but my social skill disabilities are so severe that I qualify for disability. The government gives me a monthly disability check, which means I do not have to work. As such, I have plenty of free time. During the start of lockdown, I was severely lucky that I was able to score a PS5 and an Xbox Series X using the first stimulus check. It was for the economy, so I did not feel guilty spending the money on something like that. With the second and third checks, I bought a new TV. I bought a Sony 65-inch TV, which could utilize those consoles' capabilities to their fullest. 4K, 120Hz, the works. Now, we have some neighbors, and this is where Entitled Mom comes in. My nephew, whom my younger sister was mentally incapable of caring for, is best friends with one of the neighbor's kids, and he comes over a lot. Being the kind aunt, I often let the kids use my consoles. I have some rules they have to follow face masks, hands washed, hand sanitizer, etc. because I haven't had my shot. I am allergic. I'm 100% pro shots though. After a few months, the kid begs his mom to buy him a PS5 and an Xbox and as expected, she cannot find one. She then comes to me and I swear in the most Karen of Karen voices she asks, Excuse me, can I buy your consoles off you? 
My son loves playing on them, and I would appreciate if you could give them to me. I'll give you $300. I was shocked. I knew she was looking online for them, and she knew they cost $500 each, so I responded. I can talk to people I'm familiar with, but new people I shut down easily. Um, sorry. Each console is $500 and not for sale. Sorry you're unable to find one, but I play on these all the time, and I already sold my PS4 Pro and my Xbox One X. These are all I have to play my library of games. Q entitled Parent Mode Ah, you're a young lady. You shouldn't be playing with boys' toys anyways. You should be looking for a boyfriend and enjoying life. Maybe start a family. I'll give you $500 to give me both, and that's my final offer. I was taken aback by the second lowball offer. I decided to play on Karen's lack of knowledge of how these systems worked and told her this. Ma'am, these are next generation hardware and they will not function properly on older TVs. I know you haven't gotten your son a new TV yet and the one I have there is $2,400 and is the minimum you need in order to use these consoles. Sorry, but even if I sold them to you, they wouldn't work on your older TV. Super Karen Level 2 Activated and give me your TV too. All of this is used, so I'll take them all for $1,000. Be grateful you're getting that much. Again, taken aback, but finally my mother came down the stairs, hearing all of the shouting and stepped in. Karen, it's time for you to go home. Stop harassing my daughter. And also, I feel like it would be best for my grandson if your son never came to see him again. I raised him to be a kind, generous young man, and I feel like you're a bad influence on him. Now leave my home or else I will call the police. Karen left and often when I'm going out for food or to pick up a new game at the store, I see her in the yard and she gives me this cold, evil glare like I'm the bad guy. My former employers lost their client and business because of me. A few years back in 2018, I had decided to switch employers. I worked from home as a chat support specialist and eventually a supervisor for a major tech company. I had decided to switch to a small-time customer support agency that was just starting a new chat team. They had better pay and benefits because they only had a small number of employees compared to the former. The description of the position I was to be hired for was another salary-based supervisory role for their brand new chat team for the client. I'd basically be doing the same things as my previous job but also spearheading this small department while simultaneously training other coworkers with zero experience in chat support. This was going extremely well and our client was ecstatic at the results of the new chat program. They had personally sent me an email over my progress. The company I left was, and still is, known worldwide to have the friendliest and most professional customer support team out of any other company. And so it was easy to apply what I learned to this new position. After about two months of doing this, the person I directly reported to, the regional supervisor, was retiring. Our new regional came in and was friendly at first, but decided that he didn't want to waste his time on chat and directed me to phone support, which was not in my phone description, nor what I was hired for by any means. He cited that the client was unhappy with the results, which was in stark contrast to what they had told me directly. Even after forwarding him the email, he was still not doing anything about it. So I complied. It took just two days for the client to have reached out to me personally. After explaining to them the situation, they were livid. My new regional had lied to me about his contact with the client and had essentially ignored our client's attempt to contact him about this issue. I had continued to work in the supervisory role for phones until the first quality review of my employees came up. For team leads and direct call center employees both, this is where I review their interactions and grade them based off their strengths and weaknesses. Our regional wanted me to even include the chat support team who were neither hired or trained for phones. He refused to give them training. On every single employee who was hired for chat support, I had filed all of them as unable to be completed, and in my notations, I included that this is not the position they were hired or trained for, and thus an analysis could not be accurately completed. And I sent this to both the regional manager and our client as well, since at the point I had a direct contact email. I was responded to the same day by whoever it is within our client who oversees all of the outsourcing. The only words I got back were, we will deal with this. The client held a meeting the following week with my employers. I'm not sure what was said in that meeting, 
but word got back to everyone that the client had dropped us for breach of contract. Because this was a small office and our company's only client for several years, this was bad. After that, me and my team were offered a position with the company directly, doing the things we were hired to do, but required us to move about four hours north. So unfortunately, none of us decided to accept the offer. I collected unemployment until I found a new job. Now the company is out of business and is currently being sued by some other employees for unpaid wages. The new case has been going on since 2019. Edit for clarification purposes because it seems to have confused some people. It's just one office of less than 300 employees. The name of his position was Regional Supervisor. It was pretty stupid to name him that, but that's what he was called, even though he worked the only office that existed. I'll assume it was to make the role look more attractive than it actually is. That's a common happenstance. That's not my job, ma'am. This happened two years back before lockdown struck and I had no more reason to shop for new clothes since I'm at home most of the time. For context, it was Christmas season with less than a week before the date. It was nearing the end of my 11th year and I was with my friend looking for new casual outfits for the year-end party that our school held annually. It was lunch break and we were walking around the mall located directly in front of our school. We were both wearing black pants, black leather shoes, and yellow collared t-shirts since our school decided to color code the students according to their departments. The staff inside the mall were wearing tailored shirts and skirts, so the situation I went through was even more baffling. We decided to first look at the shoe aisle since there were less people there and my friend wanted to wear new shoes during the party. I noticed that there was a group of older women, maybe in their early to late 30s, in the middle of the store whom despite the hustle and bustle were by far the noisiest there. For some reason, the moment I looked at them, a woman who was taller than me, I was small even for our country standards, and had this audacious pair of eyebrows matched with an even more offending lipstick shade was eyeing me. Let's call her Karen. My gut told me that it was not going to end well with her, and so I avoided further eye contact and just continued shopping. It was about 15 minutes later, when I finally found the dress that I wanted, that I hear the group of women saying things along the lines of, It's so messy in here. Shouldn't this be a mall? There are clothes everywhere. No one is even here to assist people. Some of the staff are just standing around. For the record, it was a fairly small store, and since it was that time of the year, the staff were awfully busy. There was a tsunami of people, so it's no question that the place had clothes lying around. The place was normally very tidy though. I just continued to ignore them and proceeded to kneel down to the floor and search the lower racks for accessories. No more than a minute later, loud stomping headed my way, followed by a sharp tap, almost a slap on my shoulder. And there she goes, Karen in her glowering stance above me. Remember, I was literally kneeling down. Without even letting me ask what her problem was, she bombarded me with her questions and accusations. I've been calling out your attention for a while now but you were ignoring me. How thick of a skin must you have? Look at this place, it's a mess. How could anyone find what they are looking for? Shouldn't you be assisting the customers and folding the clothes that they chose from, putting them back where they got them from? I had to bite my lip to stop myself from questioning her sanity. There were at least 40 customers at the store at the time. How could she expect to see a staff waiting for every single one of them? My friend, who was in the aisle behind me, was watching all of this unfold. After more than a minute of her yapping, I slowly and clearly said, Ma'am, that is not my job. I don't work here. She then interjected, saying, That's impossible. You look just like them. I wanted to capture that moment when she looked at the cashier, which was about five aisles away, and realized that we were wearing different uniforms. She backed off without apologizing and stormed off to her companions. Needless to say, she was embarrassed. I was really out of myself at that moment and my friend and I decided to just get out of the store because honestly, people were looking and I didn't want the attention. I forgot to get my stuff and my friend just paid for hers. As soon as I got home, I told my mom about it and we rushed back to the store to buy that dress that I had found. Kudos to my mom. Am I the jerk for billing my boyfriend and not caring if the providers sue him if he doesn't pay? I, 26 female have been in a relationship with my boyfriend, who's 28, for a year. He is an artist, 
That is to say, he feels like Picasso while venting his frustrations from a full-time job at a bank, accountant, and a canvas while I am a biomedical engineer. As such, I have a toolbox in the house that I bought for household repairs and the like, while another, bigger toolbox sits in my room. We don't live together. Filled with my very expensive and specialized tools I use for work. Specifically, I work at a hospital installing, maintaining, and repairing the big machinery used in diagnostics. I must remark that these tools cannot just be bought at a hardware store, as a lot of them are machine-specific or brand-specific and that I must use them to maintain the insurance and guarantee of these machines. It has never bothered me that he uses common house things to add to his canvas as he has never taken anything that wasn't already on its way to the bin or donation. But one day I got back from work and he is in the house, in my backyard, flinging paint at a canvas with some weird shape stuck to it. At first, I didn't know what he had pasted on there until I saw my toolbox dumped by his feet and a lot, a lot of the tools just strewn all around. The tipping point came when I saw my oscilloscope broken apart and glued to the monstrosity in the yard. That thing alone cost me $750, let alone the rest of my ruined tools. I saw red. I don't even remember what I said to him, only that he ran away and was actually crying, full on bawling. I had no time nor the patience to deal with that, so I took inventory of, where'd you find this guy? So I took inventory of what he ruined and talked to my boss to see what I could do. Non-electric or simple tools like special screwdrivers. How he ruined a screwdriver, I have no idea. Clamps, measuring tools, the hospital will replace at no cost. But the other ones, like the oscilloscope and a few other electric tools, I had to replace myself. I looked for the exact tools I had before and it came up to $1,876 to replace everything. Checked with a family member who is a lawyer, bought all the replacements, and sent the bill to my boyfriend. Well, his mom called me screaming, saying how could I do this to her baby, and how he doesn't have the money to pay for it. I know for a fact he does. I told her that if he doesn't pay, the provider will sue him, and so will I, and then just hung up. Not 10 minutes later, he called. He was crying and screaming, so I just left the phone next to me and continued to work. When I didn't hear the ruckus from the phone, I picked it up again, being noisy in the action. So he realizes I didn't listen to a word he said and asked if he was done throwing a tantrum. He hung up. I felt justified at the moment, but I was telling this to a coworker and he said I was too harsh, but I did what I had to do in order to continue my work. If he wanted to paint tools, there was another toolbox with cheaper stuff in the kitchen. He knows my toolbox is more expensive, so why? I don't understand. So Reddit, am I the jerk? I really hope he let out a re as he run away crying. Re am I the jerk for being at my breaking point with my husband's made up language? My husband has always been a bit goofy, giving his own names to things and doing impressions. About 18 months ago, this started to increase a lot. It's now a constant presence in our lives and I'm finding it difficult to live with. Examples, he has his own names for most retail outlets professionals and organizations. Eat your greens instead of Walgreens. He has about 30 to 40 everyday words that he insists on using in place of normal ones. Scuppers <whistles> means yes. Bing <whistles> means no. Bagayaya means good night. He constantly does weird sound impersonations, not like celebrities or characters, but a single noise that's a made up sound or something childish, like a fart from a TV show. He speaks random words like garbage or jerk whilst burping or farting. He has made up names for our friends, which he uses sometimes even under his breath when we're out with them. Pam and Will is pig and wig. I've just had enough. We got into bed the other night and I said goodnight and he said Magayaya in the high-pitched voice he always does it in. I snapped and asked why he couldn't just speak to me normally and he just laughed and came right up close to my face, and he did it again. His whistling is constant. He speaks to our kid in this stupid language, and I'm worried it's going to confuse normal language development because he changes the words so often. Our toddler could be about to hurt himself, and instead of saying no or come here, he'll say some ridiculous made up word or sound, and then get annoyed when our kid doesn't know what he wants. He's normal in other respects, 
works in finance and is totally professional around his colleagues, but different at home. I told him it needs to stop. I don't mind it occasionally or for fun, but it's all the time and it's wearing me down. He got upset and said I couldn't take a joke and that I'm not fun anymore. It's true that I've become more irritable and noise averse since we had kids, but I'm so worn out and over it and just want him to relate to me like an adult. Edit to answer some of the frequent questions. 1. I do not believe, but I'm not health qualified, that he displays any symptoms of disorders. 2. He's physically well by all measures. He's for sure not having a stroke or a significant physical health event. 3. Yes, I can see this could be a reaction to stress. 4. For those asking why I married him, he did not do this, to the extent before we had kids. Occasionally, yes, with the occasional name or word, but not in this regular. He's amazing in many other ways, but this one thing is now too much for me. I don't feel it's right to discount or throw out the whole marriage because of it, but it does need to change. 5. He will not go to therapy. 6. We have discussed it calmly previously. He did not take me seriously or make changes. He sees this as funny and just a joke. I agree that we need to talk more. 7. Yes, it can be funny occasionally. I'm not trying to spoil his fun. I also need an adult partner at times and for him to stop when not appropriate. Am I the jerk for canceling a couple of streaming services and telling my wife to get a job if she wants them back? I, 32, male, have been married to my wife, who's 33, for close to five years. We have two kids, a son who's three and a daughter who's one and a half. When we got married, we both had jobs. However, maybe about a year after we were married, my wife tearfully confessed to me that she was miserable at her job and wanted to quit. She told me that her boss was treating her like garbage and that she woke up every morning wanting to throw up. She legitimately seemed dejected and so I told her to quit and to find another job where she would be treated better. She quit. I expected her to go out and start looking for something else, but she didn't seem too eager. Whenever I gently brought it up, she responded, I'm just trying to figure out my next move. Stop pressuring me. Not long after, she got pregnant with our son, and then while he was still very young, she got pregnant with our daughter. A few months after she was born, when I asked my wife what her plans were job-wise, she finally just said, I don't want to go back to work. You make enough for us to get by. Just let me be a wife and a mother. I told her that I was concerned that I don't actually make enough to give our family as good of a life as I'd like, but she insisted that we can make it work. I have to admit, she's probably a model homemaker and mom. When I wake up for work in the morning, there's always freshly brewed coffee and breakfast waiting for me. The house is always clean, and other than yard work or repairs, I basically don't have to do anything around the house. And she's a great mother to our kids. I'm quite lucky in many ways. However, money is way tighter than I'd like. We are barely saving anything, and I'm not even able to meet my employer's match on my 401k in order to have enough for us to get by. We're living lean, eating beans and rice for dinner a couple times a week, etc. I don't feel as if I signed up for this. We were both working when we got married, and I never thought we'd have to live on just my income. I've tried to talk to her about going back to work, even part-time, to help our financial situation several times, but she just won't hear it. Recently, when I was going through our expenses, I saw that we were signed up for five streaming services. I kept Hulu and Netflix because they had more kid-based programming for our son and daughter when she gets a little older, but canceled HBO and Discovery Plus. I kept Shudder because it's cheap and I like horror. When I told my wife about it, she got angry and said I should have talked to her first, that she had shows she was watching on both of the services I'd canceled. I just responded, well, get a job and you can pay for them then. She hated that. I think it was fair, but she obviously doesn't see it that way. Am I the jerk? 23 people to serve, 15 minutes before close. I work at a relatively nice restaurant. I don't think Jeff Bezos will be in anytime soon, but it's higher end and everyone has that high expectation of it. We close at 10 p.m. Sunday through Friday and the hours are posted online and on the door. A table for 23 just came in at 8, no reservation, and requested to all sit together. My manager said, fine, come on in. Just wait an hour and 45 minutes first. So, come in at 9.45 p.m., 15 minutes before closing. Nobody told me till 9.20. Fine, parties of eight or more get gratuity automatically added, so maybe it'll be worth my time, 
even though I have to split it with the other server. 9.55 rolls around and they come in and sit. I make them order dessert first and put it into go containers because the bakery and bar close strictly at 10 p.m., no questions asked. My half of the table eventually orders, save for one guy taking his sweet time. He takes his time and then orders an appetizer. Forget you, dude, but whatever. I'll ring in the $15 appetizer for your meal, even though I'll barely get tipped for it. Nope, we were all out of appetizers, so he reluctantly orders a burger. Rare, ill. Around 11.15, an hour and 15 minutes after we close, they're ready to check out. All separate tabs. 22 checks and a crap ton of cash payments needing change I didn't have. Later, I realize someone didn't pay. Okay, cool. So you wasted my time and you stiffed me. Guess who it was? Rare burger guy. I'm mad now. I should have gone home an hour ago and the table's total was only like $500. So between me and my coworker, we only get like $40 each because they barely ordered anything. I want my $3 tip from this jerk and I want it now. I find my manager, tell her he stiffed me. He's gone. She begins to compensate the check when I notice some movement outside. They're back, all of them. To pay the tab maybe? Nope, to take pictures in front of the restaurant with everyone including the guy who stiffed me. Cool. I tell my manager and we march outside. Jerk is standing there with his girlfriend, beginning to walk the other way. But no, we run across the street. We start yelling, one of you guys stiffed us, and point directly at Rare Burger Guy. He owes me $25 for his burger, not even including the tip. He starts walking away like he doesn't hear us, but we're chasing this man, so he gives up. Already embarrassed in front of his girlfriend and 21 other friends. He pulls us aside and hands us a $20 bill. That's all the money he's got on him. At this point, Whatever, dude. I'm ready to go home. So we take the 20 and leave. No satisfaction from it. You know, if he was nice, if they didn't come in so late, if he didn't deliberately do it and then stupidly hang around outside, I would have just let my manager compensate it. But you all wasted my time. So we chased him down and it still didn't make me feel any better. So, rare burger eating jerk, forget you. Don't want 60 seconds of adjustment? Okay, enjoy waiting six weeks. So I'm a dental assistant for a private practice. Let me just preface this by saying most of our patients are wonderful people, friendly, happy to see us, respectful of our professional opinions and recommendations, etc. But literally, just like three hours ago, I had the biggest Karen in for what should have been a simple appointment. So when we do crowns, or caps as some people know them as, we prep the tooth beforehand and take an impression. Then that impression goes to a lab and the techs down there make the crown. It takes two to three weeks for them to send the crown back. When we deliver the crown to the patient, the doctor and I try the crown in first to see how it fits. It is very rare that it fits perfectly. We almost always have to make some adjustments, shaving down the crown here and there, checking the space in between the teeth, checking the bite, etc. All of this is standard. The main thing we use is called articulating paper. When the patient bites down on it, we can see heavy blue markings where the bite needs adjusting. The more we adjust, the lighter those marks get and even stop marking altogether sometimes. Most exchanges with the patient are like this. How's it feel? It's a little high. Okay, we'll adjust that. We use the articulating paper, then grind the crown down a little. How's it feel now? Oh, it feels much better. Okay, cool. Let's cement it in. This takes maybe five minutes at most. This lady we had tonight was having none of it. Us. How's it feel? Karen. Ah. It's way off. Us. Okay, we'll adjust it. How's it feel now? The same. Us. Um, really? No change? The same. Us. Okay, no biggie. Let's adjust more. We did this maybe for five minutes, over and over, and she kept insisting that it was exactly the same. No change. Even though the marks were gone at this point, meaning that her teeth were no longer even touching the crown. At this point, we had a couple options which the doctor presented to her. Doc, okay, well, I can keep adjusting the crown. The only issue is that if I keep reducing the porcelain on top, the metal underneath might end up showing. Are you okay with that? Karen, no. Doc, okay, well, then I need to make a small adjustment to the tooth above this one so that they don't touch. It's very superficial. No, don't touch my upper teeth. Doc, we do this all the time, ma'am. It doesn't harm the teeth. We're basically just polishing it. No, that's a lie. 
if you guys did it correctly the first time, you wouldn't have to adjust it at all. Me. Ma'am, we do this for everyone. The lab almost never makes them perfect. We either have to adjust the crown itself or the opposing teeth. Karen. No, you messed up. Me. Well, we have to adjust one or the other, so which would you prefer? Do you want metal showing? No! Me. So we can polish the opposing tooth? No! It'll literally take a few seconds. No, you're lying. It's going to harm my teeth. At this point, the doctor suggested getting our office manager to talk to Karen. Our office manager is an awesome lady. She's old, doesn't give a hoot, and is two years away from retirement. I told her the situation, and she laughed and said, Okay, let's make her wait another month. I don't give a hoot. So she marched right in there and said, Okay, ma'am, since you don't want this crown, we'll send it back to the lab and have them redo it. So instead of just waiting the 60 seconds for us to adjust, she now has to wait three weeks to come in again. And that's just to re-prep the tooth. Then she has to wait another three weeks for the crown to come back from the lab again. Anyways, thanks for reading. I mostly just wanted to type this out to rant. I've been working as a dental assistant for almost a decade now and I've never had an exchange like that. It was so bizarre. I straight up think she was either lying to our faces or just crazy. It made zero sense. Edit. To the people saying she has every right to request the crown to be redone, no duh. That's not my issue. My issue is that she accused us of lying, screamed at us, wouldn't tell us why it felt exactly the same and didn't want any solutions we offered. I've had many patients request crowns to be redone. Not a problem. Sometimes the color is off. Sometimes the fit is really wrong. They just weren't total Karens about it. You can be polite and still get your way. I told my in-laws exactly where my husband was at when I was in labor. I gave birth to my son 10 weeks ago. I went through exhausting periods while I was nearing my due date. I was experiencing discomfort and wanted my husband by my side when I go into labor but he'd go out every night to hang out at his friend's place and watch football games. I suggested that he play slash watch football games at home just in case, but he was having none of it and said he had to attend game night at his brother and friend's place along with his buddies. He said they had certain, how can I describe it, rituals when watching a game and he can't enjoy doing it at home or anywhere else. The night of our son's birth, my water broke while my husband was at his buddy's place watching a game. I called him and told him to get home and take me to the hospital. He said he was coming, but he didn't. I ended up calling my sister, she lives nearby, and she took me to the hospital. My husband showed up two hours later after he kept calling, asking if I was still in labor and that he was almost done watching the game. He was able to make it on time for our son's birth, but I was furious with him, mad and disappointed. He apologized profoundly and has been working on regaining my trust and respect for him after what he's done. He's otherwise very supportive and involved in our son's care. Last night, I was at my in-law's house for dinner, and we were talking about my son's birth date. My husband suddenly started recalling what happened that night and basically started lying about driving me to the hospital, waiting and feeling stressed out and standing on his feet for so long without food or even water. I was confused, and I said, No, none of this is true. None of this happened. In fact, he was watching a football game when I went into labor, and I wanted him to drive me to the hospital, but he didn't show up until two hours later. My mother-in-law, who takes no crap from anybody and whom everybody fears, lost it on him, yelling, asking him if that was true, and he kept quiet. She started losing it on him, left and right, telling him to sit down and shut up when he stood up to argue, then told him to stand up when he was sitting arguing. Everyone was laughing at how she basically treated him as if he was a boy in trouble. She kept saying, Shame, shame, shame on you. This is not how I raised my kids to treat their wives. Jordan, you are a disgrace, and I'm disappointed because of what I heard about you. He just took every bit of it and didn't say anything until we got home when he went nuts, saying I made him look neglectful, a bad husband and father by telling the family about where he was and said I shouldn't have said anything. But I argued it wasn't okay for him to lie and play hero in front of his parents. He said I just caused a riff between him and his family and asked if I was happy now. Am I the jerk? Should I not have said anything? Edit to say that he's done similar things in the past since he's a major enthusiast of football and hockey, but I didn't expect it to come to that. Also, this is not our first baby together. We have a four-year-old son. 
I feel sick to my stomach right now. What kind of father would rather watch a football game than be at the hospital when his son is about to be born? It's okay, Karen. Here, let's read our next story. I need a smoothie. You only want me working part-time in case there isn't too much work next year? Sure. I must confess, I have profound respect for people who do not take crap from their employers. You are my heroes, and so I hope my story can help someone else. Okay, so first some necessary background info. I live in a small country and I am an engineer in a very niche field. Where I live, there are about 15 to 18 people in my field in the whole country. Also, unions are a good thing here and most companies are fine with unions. The employee benefits from this, but so does the employer since the rules of the game are very clear. Clear for most people as my employer was about to find out. My story goes like this and it took place late 2019 until late 2020. My team consisted of three people, me included, and one on our team, our mentor, was ready to retire two years prior to this happening, but he stayed on because, you know, codependence issues, I guess. We had 10 to 12 years experience each. We were just younger and more inexperienced than our mentor, who has 40 plus years experience. I really envisioned us taking over the team soonish. Company is a large actor where I live, but things had not been going too great for the shareholders for some six months prior to all of this happening. Knowing this, I decide I'll not ask for a raise in my annual performance review to show I'm a team player and explicitly state this is to my boss's boss, Mr. V, is all fine and well, for three months. Then the bomb drops. One fine autumn day in 2019, I was called to a meeting with my boss, Mrs. G. Mrs. G told me that they didn't expect there to be enough work to go around for my team next year. Lockdown had not struck yet, so that was not the reason. So they wanted to cut me down to a part-time job, working only 80%. That would be about four days a week, starting three months hence. I immediately ask if this is also the case for my other coworker and if our mentor was going to retire. Well, yes, but no. My coworker would also be offered 80%. Our mentor was going to be working 60%. And I'm like, what? He really wants to retire, you know? Well, he is not yet, says Mrs. G because of reasons and stuff. Okay, so I signed the new contract, but feel bad about it since I was really trying to be a team player and did not feel my employer was taking responsibility for us employees, but only thinking of the shareholders. I also get the feeling that they do not see me or my coworker taking over the team anytime soon, despite us not being novices in the field. I immediately start planning for the future. After this happens, I start asking around if other employees are also facing part-time employment due to no projects in 2020. As one does, you want to know if others are doing right. Nobody else is getting part-timed, and everybody else is appalled. Just us three. We are singled out for some reason. Some of our colleagues even say that they have had stints of no work for months without any action taken in this regard. There is now general displeasure in my team towards our employer. Since our mentor just wanted to retire and let us do the job, there would not have been any reason to have us younger engineers working part-time, really. But no, because of reasons and stuff. Okay, so what to do? I have a family and two kids, mortgages and a lot, and this will be a blow to the family income. So I start planning to do some work on the side. Since I am an engineer, I can do consulting, right? My employment contract says no. But if my employer cannot or will not offer me a full-time job, the union contract says I can do what I want with the rest of my time, and my employer cannot interfere. I also have the right to refuse more work from my employer because I may have other obligations. Me one, employer zero. I open up my own company, buy a domain, make a web page, start calling, writing, and letting people know I am available for consulting. Of course, I checked with the union lawyers beforehand if this was okay, which it was, totally fine. They told me that since my employer laid me off and rehired me part-time, I could do what I wanted the rest of my time. This would not have been the case if I had requested part-time employment. Great. I go to work for myself then. Me too, employer zero. Almost immediately after our new contracts take effect, my employer starts noticing there's more than enough work to go around and asks me to work more hours. No, I say. Unfortunately, I have other obligations. I really didn't. I was just making a stand and enforcing them to recognize their own mistake. Time passes. My savings account drains in about three months time, but we managed to cut down on our expenses, so it's not rough seas, but still not smooth sailing by far. 
Income is a bit on the low side, although I managed to get some consulting done in my own time. I switched from sourdough bread to stale, boring white bread. Go from good beer to Bud Light to no beer. What you have to do, you have to do. No more fine roasted coffee from the small shop on the corner. Only what sludge I can get at the supermarket and brew at home. Ugh. But this is temporary, I tell myself. And then it happens. I get a big job and start moonlighting to get it done. Working evenings and weekends. And this is when crap hit the fan because word got out. I got an angry phone call from Mrs. G's boss, Mr. V, and we have a heated conversation over what I can and cannot do. The conversation was something like this, in short terms. Mr. V, think of how this reflects on our company. Me, that is not my concern here, Mr. V. I have bills to pay and mouths to feed. Mr. V, this is not what we have had in mind. Me, hey, you laid me off, man. You should know the rules of the game. You cannot dictate what I do in my spare time. Perhaps you should have thought it through when you reduced my hours. You think I was happy to lose income and would not try to remedy my financial situation? You can work more hours for us then. I have other obligations now. Can't let down my customers. Mr. V, very angry now. You should consider your next steps carefully, young man. Me. Mr. V, I shall do that. Thanks for your call. You pompous jerk, I silently added. What then followed was phone call from me to my union explaining the situation. Later that week, my employer got a phone call from the union lawyers who spoke to Mr. V in the HR department, telling them what they can and cannot do. And I just kept working for myself. Mr. V is now very unhappy, stops greeting me when we pass each other in the hallway. Me 3, employer 0. Two months later, I hand in my resignation. Three months after that, I'm gone. And to rub salt in the wounds, as they say here, is that a general expression? I don't know. Please do tell me if there's another expression in English for something to increase an already painful experience. Something remarkable happens. My coworker, not our mentor, mind you, asks if I would want to partner up and start a new company together. Yes, I say, for it was a great idea. Coworker hands in resignation a month after I handed mine in, and we start working on our own company full time. People that depend on our services are very happy about us entering the market as independent consultants. Business takes off. Me slash us for employer zero. The aftermath. My former employer has had an opening for our job since August of 2020. Our mentor told me last month he has finally put down his foot and is retiring at the end of the year as he's turning 70 soon. They will thus have gone from three people in a very niche field to zero in less than two years because of bad managerial decisions. It did not come as a surprise to me that there were no other available in the market. Since it is a niche field, I know almost every person personally, so I could have told them that everybody seemed happy with their current employer. Being a manager must suck. Oh wait, that's me now. BR from the manager. My sister is my hero. I was with my sister at a large store several years ago. I was thinking it was Walmart, but it may have been Target. First off, my sister is a sweetheart, one of the most loving people you'll ever meet. She loves everyone. If you're a good person and do good things, she will appreciate you. She doesn't yell or raise her voice ever. However, she also doesn't like or appreciate people mistreating others or injustices. She always speaks out. We were in line and it was a very busy night and we were several people back. In true sister fashion, she remembered things after we were in line and sent me to go get them. I ran to go get them and upon my return, I heard the tail end of a heated discussion which led to everyone clapping and my sister standing at the front of the line angrily glaring at this one guy three people back. If I remember correctly, we were five people back, so two people behind him. Apparently, while I was gone, the cashier had to price check something and was taking a bit longer. The cashier was a very sweet young man who was disabled. I don't think it was the cashier's fault things were slow. It was a busy spurt, meaning the store wasn't that busy, but quite a few people hit the registers all at the same time, and according to my sister, it was a series of events that caused things to slow down on our register. Anyway, the man three customers back was super upset that things were taking slow, and decided his time was more important than being a decent human being. He angrily muttered things under his breath that my sister refused to repeat. Then after the second price check, he started yelling. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. Can we get a real employee to check us out? Get this guy out of here. 
according to the woman in front of him, that was when my sister had enough. She left our cart in line and marched over to the employee and stood next to him behind the conveyor belt. She looked at the employee and told him, You're perfect, and don't let mean people try to tell you otherwise. Then she glared at the man, raising her voice to be heard since he was still yelling and now at her. He doesn't need any other reason to be slow. I assume he was cursing too, but my sister doesn't curse and when I was told what I missed, it was by my sister and the older woman. We were in our 20s. I assume the woman was mid-40s that was in front of that mean dude. Anyway, she stared daggers at him and bluntly told him, How dare you talk to someone like that? No one deserves to be talked to like that. Also, I abhor that word you used, but the only one acting like that is you. The man said something about how my sister can't talk to him like that. He's a customer. To which my sister told him, I don't work here. She said slowly and emphasized each word. And I don't know him. What I do know is you have a poor attitude and you should think about how you talk to people as you don't want to be that guy. She air quoted that for emphasis. I could hear the I don't work here as I came back and ended up running past everyone, seeing my sister still standing by the employee with her hand on his back. I ran past everyone and stood at the end of the conveyor belt. Mostly I wanted to be in between the man and my sister. Everyone started clapping by this point and were all staring at him. Some guy that was behind us was cheering on my sister and calling out things like, Dude, don't be a jerk, just shut up. No one moved or said anything else, so my sister continued. Well, as I see it, you have two choices. You can leave and go somewhere else or shut your mouth. At this point, a manager came up and stood next to me, looking around all the entire line at everyone, dead quiet, waiting to see what the man wanted to do. Is everything okay here? He asked slowly. My sister answered. This man here was mistreating your employee. The manager looked upset, but the guy was already properly shamed for his attitude, looking down, not saying anything. My sister looked at the employee, asking him if he was okay or if he needed a break. The manager was a little slow, but backed up the break, even offered to take over his lane. The employee said he wanted one, but wanted to clear his lane first. My sister refused to leave his side. I refused to move. I wanted to stay between angry guy and my sister. The manager stood next to me and took over bagging, though he told the rest of the people in the line that the other register was now open. A few people went. The guy went through the line quickly, paid and left and refused to look at anyone in the eyes. After he went through, my sister waved the guy that was behind us through so we would be last. After we finished paying, the employee came around and gave her the biggest hug and thanked her. He had tears in his eyes. He said that it happened often and this was the first time anybody had ever stood up for him. He also explained this was why he rarely helps on register unless it's late at night. My sister told him to always remember if people are mean, it wasn't his fault or his problem. It's their problem. After that, he left to go on break while the older woman stayed to talk to us and offered to buy our items. My sister refused the offer but happily talked to her while they filled me in. The manager came out a few minutes later and gave us coupons and a gift card. She took the coupons, but asked if he would give the gift card to the employee. Honestly, I'm surprised Angry Man stayed and checked out. I hope he thinks about how he talks to people in the future. Older cousin demanded her inheritance after our grandmother passed. She screams like a banshee when I tell her no. For context, my maternal grandmother is the one who passed, and my sister and I always called her by the Portuguese word for grandmother, Vô. My biological mother is Vô's second and youngest kid, with there being a 12-year gap between my aunt and my mother. As a result, my cousins from that aunt are way older than me, as in I spent a decent part of being a toddler as the flower girl at their weddings. The cousin in this story is my cousin H, who's 15 years older than me. Given the gap in age, my Vo was super involved with my sister and I as well as her great-grandkids from the older cousins. I was very close to Vo and still say even now that she was my very first best friend in this world. As she aged, Vo's health got worse and by the time I was in high school, she was on oxygen around the clock. When we were kids, she had paperwork drawn up like a will, healthcare proxies and others, just in case something happened, but we couldn't sign as we were under 18 back then. With the exception of maybe three people, most of my mother's family are huge addicts who refuse to get help. Vo didn't trust anyone other than my sister, my cousin Steve, and me. As soon as we were old enough, Vo asked us to take her to have these documents updated. 
Vo named my sister and I in the updated documents, and I had a professor at school review the new documents with me as well, so I understood them thoroughly. Steve was newly married, expecting his first kid, and renovating his new home, so Vo didn't want to stress him out more. Whenever a decision needed to be made on Vo's behalf, my sister and I would include him, and as someone older than us, we looked up to him. His sister, H, was a full-fledged addict on top of being entitled and snobby. Her husband, now X, owns his own masonry business, and they did well for themselves. But when I was in junior high, she somehow managed to steal 10k out of Vo's savings and open a credit card in Vo's name. I was upset. My Vo was devastated that H did this to her. Fast forward a bit, and during my early 20s, I get news that my Vo has a bad case of pneumonia and is hospitalized. During my school winter vacation, I spend every day with her, and the doc says to me that she'll be discharged the next day since she's better. I return to school at the end of break, and I get a call two days later from my sister. The long and short of it is that Vo took a bad turn after discharge, and it didn't look like she'll survive. I raced back home, what was a two-hour drive took maybe 90 minutes. I make it in time to say goodbye. I came in and held her hand and gave her one last kiss on the cheek. She passed about 10 minutes later. As everyone was in the elevator leaving, H asks Steve, sister, and I why we were the only three people the care team would speak to privately. We shrug it off in no mood to fuss. Sister and I get to work arranging the details of the funeral slash wake. Vo's church has a beautiful memorial for her, and after we get back to my sister's house, H starts her crap again. She had been snooping and learned that sister and I were named as the proxy in POA, with me as the primary. I confirmed this to H and she also read something about the will and that I was the executor. She starts her entitled Karen Act when I confirm the will is correct. H. Why you of all people? You're just a kid. Me. I'm 22, not 5. She picked me because she doesn't trust most of the family. H. Whatever. Just give me what Vo left and I'll go. And I'll take whatever she left for my kids too. H has two kids named Courtney and Cody. My sister, Courtney, and I were left a necklace and a ring each and a little money. Cody got roughly 9 to 10k as he didn't get much in the way of items passed down. Vo didn't think he would want women's jewelry. However, she also gave me her old engagement ring to hold until one of you kids gets engaged and wants it. J. What are you on about? H. Give me my money and my kid's stuff. J. I can't. Why? Well, if you'd read the whole will, you'd know that you didn't get anything. Why? Because Vo said you already got yours when you stole her identity and retirement savings. Whatever. Give me the stuff for my kids then. I can't. Vo had me promise not to give anything to anyone other than the people listed. I can't give you my sister's inheritance for you to give to her. It goes directly to her. Guys, H is near 40 and throws a tantrum in the driveway and calls the cops on me. Tried saying I stole everything and attacked her. It backfired on her. Cops ran all of our info and H had warrants in three states. I just can't. She also wanted me to pay her bail. I told her, forget herself. Edit. This all took place a few years ago and I ran into my old teacher who knew the situation as she was friends with Vo since they were young. I was reminded of the situation when Vo's friend and I had coffee together after running into each other. You want me to lie about my hours so I don't go into overtime? Okay. I work in theater, doing front of house slash customer service work, so that means I typically do a lot of odd hours with evenings and weekends. At my former job, they only wanted to pay me hourly, despite asking for salary numerous times, and honestly, it would have benefited them more than me. On average, my weekdays would run from 2 to 10, as I had my managerial slash admin work I had to do during the day, which I couldn't always do during shows and events. I tried to schedule things so I wouldn't go into overtime, but every once in a while, it happened. Shows run long, people like to stay and chat. Rental events don't know their timings well and really mess up the time. It happens, just part of the job. So it would be pretty common for me to finish with 8.5 or 9 hour days. And since I was paid hourly, that meant overtime. Eventually, my boss and the executive director talked to me about why I so often went into overtime and why did I come in early when I knew I'd be staying late. I outlined that unless I couldn't, I would schedule my days to try and have some leeway to avoid daily overtime, but it wasn't always possible and they should understand that, especially my boss as she had my position at one point before I started. 
While they did acknowledge that point, they didn't want to constantly pay for a little bit of overtime. Their solution was for me to adjust the hours on my timesheet on a day I worked over 8 hours and just take what would have been overtime and put it on a different day. In other words, misuse labor laws so they wouldn't have to pay me an extra 9 or so dollars for the half hour of daily overtime. I was unimpressed, but I was already looking for a new job, so I decided to play ball because I knew I could still make my point with some malicious compliance. Thankfully, that first week, there were events I knew would likely run long, and they didn't disappoint. I ended up having to spread 6.5 hours of work over two days, one of which I came in after five, but I ended up putting on my schedule that I came in at two. Still, the same hours worked, just spread out to avoid the daily overtime. Well, of course, when timesheets were checked over, this was noticed that there were two days I charged for being in the office when I wasn't by our accountant. When she asked what the situation was, I explained that I did what was requested. I took the daily overtime hours and moved them to days I wasn't going into overtime. Thankfully, the accountant and I were pretty close, so she just rolled her eyes at the stupidity of it all and went to talk to my boss and the ED about it. The cherry on top of it all? Because I still claimed the same amount of hours, I still went into weekly overtime which ended up meaning I got more money because the weekly hours all came in one lump rather than being spread out over the daily hours. Four hours at 1.5 hours and 2.5 at double hours rather than the 6.5 all at the time and a half. Oddly enough, for the last couple months I worked at that mess of a theater, they didn't really harp on me about daily overtime anymore. Am I the jerk for telling my wife that she is the mediocre one? My wife and I are both highly educated people we both have doctorates and several master's degrees, as well as being successful in our professional lives. We also have a son, Caleb, who's 18, male. He's our pride and joy. Throughout Caleb's life, my wife and I have had some disagreements about parenting. I'm someone who values my son being a well-rounded person, which means I don't want Caleb just to have good grades, and I don't care if he doesn't get a perfect score. And my wife is someone who values grades and discipline. It has taken us a long time to find a balance between what me and my wife want. Caleb in his first semester of law school. One of the requirements to graduate is to certify that you know the English language. Since Caleb already has a certification, he decided to pick up German as a fourth language. I advised him to maybe wait till third semester to start learning German just to give himself time to get used to how university works and also because he has a history of pressuring himself a lot when studying. Caleb was adamant on starting now so I didn't push the issue forward. He just finished his second evaluation and he's not doing as well as he expected. He's doing, in my opinion, fine. 9 out of 10 in his first test and 8 out of 10 on his second test, but he is very upset with himself. I tried to console him and told him that if he wanted to, we could look for some private tutoring and I also reassured him that for someone who has never spoken an ounce of German, he's doing amazing. My wife, on the other hand, is furious with him. She told him that his grades are unacceptable and to start putting in more effort on his education. Caleb got even more upset and started crying. She tried to ground him for two weeks with no outings, but I didn't let her do so. So now she's mad with me. She says that my weak parenting is allowing our son to be mediocre and that she didn't raise Caleb to be average. I got mad because our son is nor average nor mediocre. So I asked her, how many languages does she speak? My wife answers, one. So I tell her that she really doesn't have a say on this particular issue since out of the three of us, she is most likely the mediocre one in that department. She got even more furious, so now I'm sleeping on the couch until further notice. I think I really messed up here, but I got very mad with her for making our son cry, so I couldn't keep quiet. Am I the jerk for refusing to give my parents my password now that I'm an adult? This happened a few months ago and my dad is insistent that I'm the jerk here. My parents have always been kind of overprotective. Ever since I was old enough to make my first social media accounts, they insisted that they had to have the passwords to them. Being around 11 years old at the time, I agreed. I soon got upset though, since I started noticing messages being sent that weren't typed by me on my account. If my friends swore, my parents would send them a message acting as if they were me, being rude to them and telling them that I didn't want to be friends with them anymore. This caused a lot of fights between me and my friends. Meanwhile, my parents stated that it was for the best. As I got older, this behavior just got worse. Around high school, my dad installed security cameras in the house. He said it was for keeping us safe, but honestly, it feels like I'm in prison. 
The cameras are all in different angles to make sure there are no blind spots. They've placed them in the kitchen, the living room, and all of the hallways. None in the bedrooms or bathrooms though. He can check them on his phone along with use them as an intercom system to get upset at me if I'm doing something he doesn't like. He made me install an app on my phone that logs where I go, for how long, and how I got there. It keeps this information for about a week and notifies him if I turn off my location sharing. He checks it often and then asks me about it almost daily. Example, I saw you went to X's house today. How was that? He also keeps a paper in the house with all my usernames and passwords for every social media account I have that they know about. They make me update it yearly and test it before letting me go to make sure that it all works. They say that it's for safety reasons so that if I go missing or something, they can check who I was talking to. However, I'm 21 now. I live with them to save money since I'm still a full-time university student. Recently, my dad asked me to update the passwords and I told him no because I would like to have some privacy now. He got extremely upset and used his parental controls on the Wi-Fi to cut my devices from getting connected for a week. I wasn't able to do my homework properly and I couldn't call with friends or anything because I didn't have much data in my phone plan. I got upset with my dad and got into a pretty bad argument with him. He said that he was just protecting me and that as my father it was his job to make sure that he always knew where I was and what I was doing. I tried talking to my mom about this but she said I shouldn't keep seeing the both of them as the bad guys and that I would eventually understand. She cried during our conversation and kept telling me how much I hurt my dad by implying that I don't trust him. I've always been introverted and never go anywhere without telling them. I don't think I need to be surveilled this heavy, but I do feel bad for upsetting my mom so much. Am I the jerk? Edit. Whoa, uh, this blew up overnight. Thank you to everyone who messaged me and gave me advice in here. To be honest, I was a little nervous posting on here because, I don't know, maybe I thought people would think I was completely in the wrong. I know it's the point here to find out, but ugh. anyways, some things to clear up. I'm 21, female. I forgot to mention that. I don't really mind people using he slash him for me in here since they didn't know, but I just thought I'd say. I work part-time and I don't pay for rent, utilities, or Wi-Fi. My parents do ask me for large sums of money every once in a while to pay for stuff around the house, fixing the broken fridge, getting the heater replaced when it died, etc. I live in Canada, so uh, the stuff in Australia and USA doesn't help me, but I appreciate it anyway. I'll try to update you guys in the future. Thank you to everyone for your advice and for wishing me good luck. Karen pulled a prank on me that ended our friendship. I'm a 24-year-old man, and my friend Jess is a 22-year-old woman. We've known each other for about three years since we met in a class. We've always been platonic, and to be completely honest, I'm not the type of guy to go for it. Yesterday, Jess was supposed to move. I was going to drive my truck over to her place, help her load up her stuff, and get her out of her apartment. Her situation with her roommates has become highly unstable, so she was in a rush to leave. The day before yesterday, as a way of thanking me in advance, Jess ordered pizza for the two of us. We were sitting there watching a movie on my couch, being platonic friends as usual, and suddenly she inched closer to me. I figured it was nothing until a minute later she got a little closer. Then she got a little closer, and all I could do was think about how it was finally happening. She squeezed up really close next to me, and looked up into my face. I'm not the most confident guy, so all I could say was, hi, to which she responded, hi. Then she asked if I wanted to do something. I asked what something was, and she said, oh, you know, something. Still trying to keep room for plausible deniability, again, I laughed and said that I didn't know what something was. She kept staring at me and nodding, and I thought I'd take my chances. I asked her if I could kiss her. She immediately stood up, walked to the other end of the room, and sat down on the armchair. Then she took out her phone. I immediately apologized to her, and she said that I should just forget it. A few minutes of incredibly awkward silence passed, and then she said, I guess Kim, her best friend, was right. I asked what Kim was right about, and she explained that for several years, Kim has repeated again and again that I was only trying to hook up with her. Apparently, Kim put her up to testing me. I felt horrible. Immediately, I apologized to Jess again, said that while I found her attractive, I'd do nothing to hurt our friendship, and then apologized yet again. Jess accepted it while crying a bit. 
Then I told her she had nothing to worry about. After Jess went home, I got to thinking that it was incredibly mean-spirited that she would do that to me. I apologized, but that juvenile high school prank just started to strike me the wrong way. I talked to my sister, who I can talk to about anything, who reinforced that it was disgusting behavior. Then she asked for Jess's address, which I declined to give her. The next morning, instead of meeting up with Jess at the promised time, I just didn't. I had taken the day off work, but I went in anyway because I wanted to get my mind off of what had happened. Jess was blowing up my phone all day, and then I got a couple of texts from a number that I didn't recognize, which I imagine was Kim. Finally, Jess called me a creep, and that was the end. I'm really mixed on this. I feel kind of bad, but not so bad. Was I wrong? Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or Jess? Please let us know. This is why Reddit boy is the only man I talk to. All the others just want a taste of what I got. Am I the jerk for kicking out my sister-in-law? She left a fake pregnancy test in my room. I'm 33, and my husband, Adam, who's 36, came back from his month-long trip days ago. My in-laws live states away, and my sister-in-law, who's 20, was staying with me since she got kicked out of her dorm. Adam and I got back from the airport at 7 p.m. and my family came to visit. Adam went inside the bedroom and started unpacking while I was in the kitchen with my mother. I suddenly heard Adam shouting my name. He told me to come upstairs ASAP. He sounded very angry. I went to meet with him in the bedroom and I saw him holding a positive pregnancy test in his hand. I was dumbfounded. He began questioning me, saying he found it inside my sock drawer. He asked, you go and explain to me what the heck this is doing here. I was speechless from my shock. As I understood what this might have looked like to him, I said I had no idea. It wasn't mine and I had never seen it before. He kept telling me to explain how it got there if I had never seen it and it wasn't mine. My family heard the commotion and tried to intervene, but Adam locked the door. I freaked out because I literally had no idea what was going on. Adam said he just wanted me to be honest. I said he had the right to be mad but I knew nothing about it and had no explanation. He said Matt doesn't even begin to cover it, then suddenly started putting everything back in his bags, saying he was going to stay with a friend until I call him up with an explanation. He unlocked the door and found my family waiting. His sister showed up, asking what was going on, then started laughing, asking, So, was it really positive or not? I was stunned as she proceeded to say she planted the pregnancy test in the drawer as a prank, and that everyone should calm down. She was like, Bruh, chill. Have you ever heard of fake pregnancy tests? They're pretty telling. I was livid. I screamed at her, asking how she thought this was funny and that it was okay to humiliate me in front of my family. She tried to justify it, saying it was her boyfriend's, who has ASPD, by the way, idea to bring laughter to the atmosphere. But I told her she was no longer welcome at my home after what she did. Adam took a seat to calm down, watching us argue as my mom got involved, asking me to take it easy. I insisted that my sister-in-law pack and leave right then, and she started crying and apologizing, saying she had nowhere to go, begging Adam to do something, but he didn't. I called her an Uber and had her leave. Mother-in-law heard and started calling me, shaming me for kicking out her daughter like that. I told her what her daughter did, and she still said my reaction was over the top, as her daughter is being naive and as a kid acting recklessly. She said we're her family and I should consider taking her back, but I said I won't. Edit. I too was confused by Adam's reaction and have a feeling he was in on the prank too, based on how serious he was being. Mom thought the same thing and I wouldn't be surprised since A, he remained quiet when I argued with his sister, and B, he always does pranks with her and sees nothing wrong with her behavior. He actually thinks she's funny. I don't know if I'll ever be sure about him taking part in her pranks. Edit. Adam and I struggle with infertility on his side because of his health issues, so that added to my anger since it seemed like his sister was being cruel and insensitive. Who do you agree with? OP or sister-in-law? Please let us know. I'd call up those in-laws and tell them why don't they take her in. A trip around the world in 80 minutes. This story comes from when I worked in an inbound call center. I handled escalation calls. When someone called in regarding their service plan with complaints that cannot be handled with a regular agent's authority or the caller demanded to speak with a supervisor or manager, the call got transferred into my team's call queue and one of us handled it. Little background. I was born and raised in the Southwest. When I was a wee child, I spoke with a very heavy stutter. 
It took several years and lots of patience on my mother's part to teach me how to speak normally. The outcome was that I had to enunciate all my words carefully and thus spoke without any hint of a local accent. Later, during my middle school days, I got teased a lot for not having a proper accent, so I decided to teach myself how to spike with the proper accent. I watched a lot of my dad's old black and white westerns to learn the lingo. Then I started talking like Scotty from the original Star Trek series. It was fun, so I started copying other accents from TV and movies. I had over a dozen, including German, pirate, and badly dubbed Chinese kung fu. Lots of pauses, simple phrases, and every sentence ends in HA! One bad side effect came about though. Often, when I'm around a person with a heavy accent, I subconsciously begin to mimic their accent. I don't realize I'm doing it until it's pointed out. Usually, the other person thinks I'm making fun of them or something. To avoid getting punched in the face, I have to do some quick explaining without the borrowed accent. So the call. A call comes into my queue and I answer it as normal. Kind of. I had been joking around with my supervisor while using an Indian accent, so when I answered the call, I was still using the accent. The woman caller was immediately furious. She started screaming at the top of her lungs that she had specifically demanded to someone who spoke English, not a, well, let's just say her choice of words lay heavy on the mean side and leave it at that. Realizing my error, I dropped the accent and tried to talk to the lady normally, but she would have none of it. She continued on her horrible diatribe about call center workers, how there weren't any proper English speakers anymore, and cussing me up one side and down the other. Now I've handled a lot of angry calls by small-minded people, but there is one hot button I will not tolerate. The caller started insulting my parents. You wish to talk to someone who speaks English, correct? I broke in, dropping back into the Indian accent at the same time. Yes. Not a problem, I said. I will transfer you to someone who speaks English. But I must warn you, do not disconnect from the call for any reason whatsoever. We are experiencing a rather large call volume at this time. You are currently at the top of the queue. But if you disconnect and call back, you will be all the way back at the bottom of the call line. And you do not want that, correct? God, no. Very well. Please stay on the line and the next available English speaker will be with you shortly. Have a most pleasant day. Then I put her on hold. It should be noted that we were not supposed to put callers on hold, but I did so that she would, one, think she was being transferred, and two, make her listen to the horrible hold music. Placing a caller on hold immediately sent up a red flag in the call monitoring software. Normally, a supervisor would come storming over and demand answers. My supervisor, however, had his cubicle right next to mine and had been leaning over the top when I had initially fumbled the call. He had also patched his phone into my line and heard everything the caller had said. What are you doing? He asked, while smiling a wicked smile. Exactly what she demanded. She wants to talk with someone who speaks English. Then that is exactly what she's going to get. I replied with my own grin. After five minutes, I took the call off hold and answered with my best Russian accent in place. Then on hold again, five minutes later. German accent, then French, then Swedish, then Mario Brothers Italian, so on and so forth. For over an hour, I kept transferring this jerk each time, answering the phone with both good, bad, and horrible accents speaking English. I thought for sure she would have caught on around the 30 minute mark when I spoke pirate. She didn't, so I continued. After about one hour and 20 minutes of sending this woman on a verbal tour of the world, she was sobbing so hard I could barely make out her distressed words, so I went in for it. I answered the phone with a thick southern draw. She was so happy. She spent a good 10 minutes telling me what a horrible experience she has had just to finally talk with someone who speaks proper English. I asked her what I could do for her and she told me what her issue was. It was something so simple that one of the regular agents could have handled it in less than two minutes. Finishing up the call, the woman once more thanked me for speaking proper English. I dropped back into the Indian accent. Not a problem at all, madam. It was a pleasure to handle your call. You know, it's funny. You sound just like a woman I spoke to an hour ago. Isn't life strange? With a satisfied smile, I hung up during the scream of choking rage. What do you mean I can't stay in a room I didn't pay for? Ah, the life of night audit. Tonight, the tale of Karen and the sold out night. Our cast tonight includes me, super awesome amazing evening girl, super mega jerk Karen 
henceforth referred to as Karen, and the police. Our tale begins at 10 when Karen came down to get a room transfer. See her precious little dumplings wheelchair did not fit into a normal room. Our evening girl transferred her to an ADA room. I get a text at 10.30 saying that Karen is still in the original room. I come in at 11 and this is what follows. Me. So, what's up? Evening girl. Well, I transferred her and checked someone else into that room, but they came back down saying it was occupied. Me. Alright, you mind staying a bit late and watching the desk? I head upstairs and knock on the door. Me. Front desk. Ma'am, you need to vacate the room. Karen. What? I have this room. I don't understand. Can I call you on the phone? Me. No, you need to open the door and vacate the room. Back and forth for 10 minutes. Finally head down and she's on the phone with Evening Girl. She hands me the phone. Me. Ma'am, you need to vacate the room. That room is no longer yours. But the Evening Girl said that she just transferred my daughter, not me. Me. No, she transferred the room. That means everyone in the original room needs to move to the new room. Well, she said, and I'm saying you have two options. Either vacate the room or vacate the property. Well, she said, I understand that is what you heard, but you need to vacate the room. But you're not listening to me. She said over and over for five minutes. Finally, me. All right, ma'am, your options have changed. Either vacate the property or the police will assist you. Karen. But she said I hang up on her. Shortly after, I get a notification that a police call is going out from that room. Yay. I call the non-emergency number and explain the situation. He updates and says police are on their way. While we are waiting, she decides to come down. It's now 11.30. Karen. I'm just trying to understand because there was a miscommunication. You said that you transferred my daughter to a different room. Evening girl. I said I transferred the room. I did not make you an entire reservation due to the fact we are sold out. You never told me that. You said you moved my daughter. Me. Ma'am, we aren't talking about this. Either leave or the police will make you leave. Karen. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to her. Me. I don't care who you're talking to. The fact remains. What is your decision? But she said... Oh, here we go again. That goes on for a bit until finally we walk off and wait for the cops. Oh, and in the scuffle, we learned that her kid she moved to the room is 10. Police finally get here and she spends a sob story about how the mean hotel worker is kicking her and her disabled kid onto the street at midnight. I explain to the police that she is trespassed and can no longer stay here. The kid can stay here with the other adult, but she is no longer allowed to stay. Surprise! She lied about having another adult. She has three rooms, one with her in it, the vacant room, one with a 10-year-old in it, one with three other kids in it. The police really don't want the backlash of kicking out a disabled kid, so I offer to come to a middle ground. I call my manager and we come up with a plan. Karen has two options, pack everyone up and leave or fit everyone into the King ADA room, which we are breaking fire code offering it to her. She tries wiggling her way out of it, but luckily the cop shuts her down. Karen, but earlier the other girl said cop. It doesn't matter what she said. These are your options right now. Karen. I'm just trying to understand why she said cop. You can figure that out later. Which option do you want? Well, I need to go talk to my kids. Cop. You are their mother. You don't need to talk with them. Make a decision. I don't see why we can't stay how we are. Cop. You were given two options. They are being generous here. They're breaking fire code for you, so you don't have to pack your kids up and move hotels. I will move into the king and my other kids can stay in the other room. That's not an option. Fine. So I guess then I'll wake up all of my kids and force them to move to the one room where someone will have to sleep on the floor. Cop. Good choice. All right. How long is it going to take you to move everything? An hour. An hour? Okay, fine. You have an hour to move everyone. You're not to come back down here and squabble. Karen. Just keep her away from me. Meaning me. Me. I will rekey the rooms at 1.30 and I have nothing more to say to you. Cop. Alright. So no squabbling. If you come down and start, she can call us back and you will be asked to leave. If you do not move by 1.30 and there are more problems, you will be asked to leave. Is that clear? Yes. She starts walking away, 
and before the cops have even moved, she comes back. And don't think I won't go to social media. I will call you out by name. I will. Cop. Stop. See this? This is squabbling. Just go to the rooms and get your kids. Leave her alone. Well, I want the manager's number. Me. I'm not giving you her number. You can call the direct line. I want her name then, and her email. Me. Her name is doesn't take any BS manager who's upset that I woke her up already, and she's upset at Karen. She will be back at 7 a.m. No, I want her name written down. All right, here it is. She storms off again and comes back down after the cops have left. My key doesn't work, and I hope you're happy with yourself. Karma is coming for you. Me, thinking of the amazing Reddit story. Yes, it is. Karen, and I will never be staying here again. Me, thank the Lord. And don't have your evening girl tell guests lies. She didn't. Here's your key. I'll be up at 1.30 to change them. She then came down multiple times saying the key didn't work for her kid's room. I finally went up and the door was locked. Me. The pull lock is engaged, meaning a key is useless. You'll need your kids to unlock it from the inside. Surprised that when I went up, the rooms were empty. But there was trash all over and the phone was pulled out of the wall in the vacant room. And the kid's room door had something shoved in to keep it open that I couldn't find. You'll lose most of your money if you cancel your holiday with us. I recently had a holiday booked to Mexico, which at the time of booking, early 2020, it came to around 2,200 pounds for two people for two weeks. We were pretty fortunate to have been able to get that at that sort of a price. Anyway, lockdown happened, and as you can imagine, the holiday we booked with two, British holiday travel agent, was postponed. Feeling a little anxious to go abroad, even when restrictions were lifted, my partner and I decided we wanted to cancel and rebook at another time. Truth be told, we could have also benefited quite a lot with having some of that money back. I called them to cancel after a rather lengthy hold to get through to them to be told, Sorry, if you want to cancel, you will lose 2100 of your 2200 pounds that you paid. However, you can make a free of charge amendment and you or we will pay the difference. So if your new holiday is cheaper, we will refund the difference. Okay, let me speak with my partner and see what we can do. Malicious compliance begins. I have no interest in postponing my holiday, so I browse their other destinations on the website. I phone back the next day. Hi, I'd like to make an amendment to my booking, please. Two, sure, no problem. Do you have a destination in mind? Me, yes. I found this rather appealing location in the Canary Islands, which also happens to be your cheapest holiday. Oh, and I want to amend it from two weeks to your minimum stay. Two, okay, so you'll have a refund of 1,750 pounds and your holiday has now been amended. After receiving my refund a few days later, I call them and tell them I wish to cancel my new crappy cheap holiday. At this point, I've lost about half of what the crappy cheap holiday would have cost. Instead of losing 2,100 pounds, I only ended up losing 280. Granted, it's still not ideal to have lost out on 280 pounds, but it sure is better than losing most of what I paid. Edit. To those saying about chargeback, I didn't purchase the holiday on a credit card, I used a debit card. Chargeback wouldn't have worked as the money belonged to me, not the bank. Edit 2. For those saying this isn't malicious compliance, if their policies were designed to make things difficult for the customer, they wouldn't have made the refund process so difficult. I would say this is malicious compliance as I was using a loophole in their policies to ensure the best result for me. Edit 3. Well, I didn't know you could do chargebacks on debit cards. Thank you for educating my smooth brain. Rude? We're just sold out. So this lady's called me three times within the last hour or so. First time she called, I was being the semi-cheery front desk agent I always am. Tried to answer her million questions without sounding annoyed because there was a line forming in front of me, even though half her questions were different variations of the same things. She's asking about jacuzzi rooms, and I finally get her to understand they're at our sister property down the street. So after 80 more questions about transportation from there to the restaurant and spa, I go ahead and transfer her and assume it's the end. Phone rings again. I can't not recognize the voice I spent 30 minutes rephrasing answers to. She asks about jacuzzi rooms again, and this time it only takes about 10 minutes to remind her we don't have jacuzzi rooms at this location and transfer her to the sister property. I hope and pray that's the end, because between two weddings and a 66th high school reunion, 
I simply don't have the time to entertain the ramblings of this person. Again, another call from this lady wasting my time because she can't seem to understand that we do not have the room type she's looking for. Again, I transfer her to our sister location and ask the gods why they have to plague my time with someone this blatantly moronic that they do not understand a very simple thing about being told well over the acceptable number of times to be told something. Like, just try looking online since you can't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth apparently. I then get a call from the spa upstairs. Nothing out of the ordinary because people want to charge services to their rooms all the time. Spa girls can be a bit rude, but in my experience, that's everyone in the cosmetology industry. But today, she sounded extra rude, like it was on purpose. She asks me if there's any male down here answering phones because this lady has been hung up on by some rude man a couple times now. I tell her it's just me and my feminine customer service voice. She proceeds to tell me whoever is answering phones keeps hanging up on her and that she needs a room from date X to date Y. I tell her I know the lady, that she called three separate times and I probably totaled close to an hour with her. I let our spa know she's insistent on a jacuzzi room and that I've already transferred her to our property with jacuzzis three times. I guess the first time she was transferred over, she was told they were sold out for her dates. I say, well, there's not much we can do about being sold out. I'm sorry if she thinks that's rude. Spa lady then says the following to me, paraphrased because I'm still seething. Okay, well, she's really upset because I guess front desk agents have been really rude to her all day and hanging up on her and we've gotten a lot of complaints recently about how the front desk staff is just all really rude. So I'm going to leave a message for management so they can address it with you all because there's really no reason to be treating guests like this. It's not only losing business for you guys, but us as well, and it's unacceptable. Hopefully, they'll call a meeting or something. What? After that, she just hangs up, and I'm still standing there, holding the phone with my mouth open. I'd like to see her work a real front desk someday, where she doesn't get to be some stuck-up jerk because she can. See her put on that fake customer service voice we all have to have, and deal with people yelling at her. She's not my boss. She's not even the boss of the spa. She's just the jerk who books the appointments. Leave a message for the managers and have a meeting. <laughs> ah, thank y'all. I just needed to get that off my chest or else it was going to weigh on me all night. Am I the jerk for not watching my sister while my parents are in Italy? So ever since I, 22 male, graduated from college, I have a serious struggle with independence and boundaries with my parents. More specifically, my mother. I moved to the city that I grew up in because I received a fantastic job opportunity that I couldn't turn down coming straight out of school. My sister, 14, was extremely excited because that meant that she could be closer to her brother for a few more years. Unfortunately, this means that my parents feel entitled to frequent visits and regular meetings. I have my own apartment that is somewhat close to their house, which doesn't help my case. I often work 12 to 14 hour shifts and I can sometimes work nights with less than a day's notice. That, alongside trying to kindle friendships and hobbies, I can be very stretched for time. Anyways, my mother just informed me that they will be going to Italy next summer, 2022, and that I have to help out with my sister. She tells me that I have to stay at their house for the two weeks that they are gone and I can just commute from there. My commute is already 45 minutes from my apartment and they're about 15 minutes further away. That also doesn't take into account the fact that I will be on a different job by that time that will be even further away. So this would result in one and a half hours with minimal traffic for my commute from their house. Having to wake up at 4.30 a.m. to not get home until 7.30 p.m. just doesn't sound like something I want to do. She states that they legally cannot leave my sister home alone for that long, but I've looked at the law in my state and it does not state anything about age restrictions like this. But even to that point, she will be 15 at the time of the trip. I might sound naive, but I feel like a 15 year old does not need a full time babysitter. I've told her that I'm more than happy to help out and stop by the house and take her out occasionally, but that I cannot responsibly stay at their house for that long. Heck, I even said that I can stay the night on weekends or nights I don't have to work. She then responds with, yes you can, you can stay there. She refuses to see the fact that I will be so far away for more than half the day. I have my job and responsibilities to tend to, and my girlfriend and I will be living together by then. Eventually, just said that I'm unprofessional and immature and that they will find someone else because I'm too much of an inconvenience. I'm more than happy to help and I'm excited for them to be going on this trip, 
but being that far from work for so long does not make sense to me. I just find it disrespectful that she would demand that I do this, especially after booking the trip and not asking me beforehand. Am I the jerk? Edit. For everyone saying that I could take her to my apartment, that's fair. However, they have two dogs and two cats that I'm assuming they won't pay to have boarded. But thanks for the support. Should I expose my mom's Facebook lies? I, 28 female, moved in with my conservative parents for a few months earlier this year because they needed help with life during lockdown. During that time, like many people, I launched myself into baking. It's always been a special hobby as I'm pretty shy and baking things for people I care about is one of the few ways I can express myself. Over the years when I've made something challenging, my mom, who's 65, has insisted I send her photos. I always thought it was cool that she was interested and would send her lots of pictures. Needless to say, when I was living with her, she was hovering around like some kind of pastry paparazzi. Tonight while visiting, mom asked me to help her with her Facebook privacy settings. While doing so, I discovered that she's been posting pictures of my bakes with me cropped out and claiming them as her own creations. I haven't added her on Facebook, so I had no idea that she had been doing this for literally years. The captions were always something like, freshly baked apple pie, thank goodness OP can rely on me to bake for her. Underneath the posts, family and friends usually comment on how great she bakes and that I was spoiled for being a grown adult who still didn't know how to cook. After going through all of the posts, I noticed there was a theme. She depicts me as a pathetic lonely loser incapable of looking after myself. Most of her family lives overseas and have no idea that she's lying while her friends don't know me well enough to question it. So Reddit, would I be the jerk if I logged into my mom's Facebook and changed all the captions to be more honest? I hate confrontations, but I don't know what to do. Update. It's been almost 24 hours and I just want to say thanks to everyone who has responded. You're all totally right. My initial approach was immature and lazy. I was taking the easy way out and not facing having the awkward and frankly painful conversation required. I spent some time today practicing what I want to say so that I don't freeze up like I usually do. I've also told my dad about the posts. He doesn't have Facebook. He was shocked but not surprised. He said that she's previously posted fake holiday photos and once claimed she had rescued a puppy. She thinks it's funny and that they're just white lies. He found out when he ran into people who asked him about them, which led to a lot of confusion and embarrassment for him. He's asked me to come over tomorrow. He's going to help keep things calm so that I can talk to her. When she gets upset, she starts shouting, which usually ends the conversation because I freeze up. I've had time to cool down, and while I'm still really hurt, I mainly just feel overwhelmingly sad for her. I think our chat might turn into a bigger mental health discussion because as many people have pointed out, she must be deeply unhappy with parts of her life if she has to pretend to be this apple pie baking, puppy saving, luxury holiday taking person. Regardless of how the chat goes, I know I need some time away from her to process things. As suggested, I've added a few members of my mom's family on Facebook where I've uploaded pictures and progress shots of my baking. I exchanged messages with my aunt, mom's cousin, this afternoon that I haven't seen since I was a kid and arranged to video chat with her and her family this weekend. She mentioned that she loves cooking and sent me a family recipe that I plan to record and share with just my family. I'll probably babble all the way through it and look stupid, but I'm excited to find a positive way to clear my name. I've gotten so many great ideas from everyone here and I'm grateful to you all that I didn't go through with my terrible original idea. I honestly can't thank you folks enough for your advice. Karen fakes being pregnant to keep mooching off of me. I'm 20, female, and my brother, who's 24, has been on and off with his girlfriend, who's 27, for a couple of years now. It's been the same song and dance. They're happy for a few weeks, then something small happens, they argue, it gets really nasty, and they make up and are back to being a loving couple. When I learned my brother got kicked out of his apartment and needed a place to stay, I offered him the extra room in my apartment and my brother agreed to pay rent, help with bills, and pitch in with food. For three months now, she's been announcing she's pregnant. She alone will eat a snack box with 50 small bags of chips in a week. I tried to reason with her and get her to cut back, not only from overeating, but she was running us low on food but she insists she and the baby are healthy and it's just cravings, blah, blah, blah. Since last month, most of what my parents send to my house, my mom is a couponer, so she bulk shops and gives away what she has too much of. My brother's girlfriend is the first to get into it and a large portion of it is gone by a few days to a week. From a 24 case of Monster, 
the energy drink if you're not familiar, eight will be gone in a week from just her. She eats a crap ton of food too, most of which no pregnant woman should be consuming so much of. And yes, I know all pregnancies are different, but words can't explain how much she eats in one sitting. So today, I had seen her drinking coffee, and after her second cup, I asked her if she should be drinking so much coffee, and she said her doctor told her it was fine and she had no worries. When I suggested she take on a healthier diet for the baby, she just scoffed and walked out. I went and asked my brother if he's been to any of her doctor's appointments or even seen a positive pregnancy test, and he said he hasn't. I confronted her about it, and she said she didn't have to prove anything and started to get defensive. I told her she needed to show a test or some proof of going to the doctor or she needs to move out as she doesn't help at all. My brother started defending her and changed his answer from not seeing any proof to seeing her pregnancy test. My parents got word of what I said and my mom says I was in no place to say anything and everyone's body is different and I wouldn't know since I've never been pregnant. Am I the jerk? Edit. I did talk to her a while ago about getting a job as well as helping out financially and she said she'd start and never has. Right, so based on the majority of the comments, I overstepped, yes, but I'm going to go with my gut on this one and give them their 30 days notice and call it a day. I'll for sure update you guys in a month when they're to be gone and let you all know who's interested, what's happened by then. I keep repeating myself. Let me add, my brother knows everything I've said, the excessive caffeine, no ultrasound, etc. No, I was not faking concern by the coffee comment. She drinks two cups of coffee a day along with a monster. That's a ton of caffeine. I sold my home to avoid my neighbors and their kids. Quite a few years ago, I, 32, male, and my partner, 29, female, moved into a stacked unit in a residential complex. We are happily child-free. I started renting the unit from someone I worked with after they had moved out of the same unit. They had cats. We had a cat. We were told that this is perfectly fine and for some time it was. In 2017, the owner of the unit decided to sell and I took out a mortgage to buy it. I did this because the unit is great and we liked living here. It's close to work, it's a nice area and there were no issues worth mentioning. This was the first property I've ever bought. Shortly after this, I get an email informing me that having pets is not allowed and we need to get rid of our cat. Now, besides the fact that this isn't entirely legal, I was not about to get rid of my cat. I attend the next body corporate meeting where I explain that one, I was told that it was fine, and two, one of the trustees within the association knows about my cat and had previously approved it. This trustee in question corroborates my point and we begin to discuss what should be done about pets. A decision is reached where new pets will not be allowed without approval while current pets can remain until they pass away. However, Residents will have to resolve any issues should tensions arrive due to roaming pets. I agree to this. My cat roams a little, but never causes a problem. We also keep her inside most of the time and the entirety of the evening. At this meeting, I decide to join the trustees for our body corporate. I know that I've already put a sour taste in the chairperson's mouth by showing up and arguing my case, but I truly want to help and keep things in order. After all, I now own property that is worth caring about. Side note. The chairperson's son is the caretaker for the residential complex. For about two more years, everything is fine. Residents come and go, but we are quite happy. The complex gains a few families with kids, which means things get somewhat noisier. We don't like kids or the noise they create, but hey, kids will be kids and we can always put on some music for a while. But there is this one girl who likes to screech at an ungodly volume. Oh well, whatever. Fast forward and it's the start of 2020. Early in this year, we got new neighbors. Units are pretty close to each other in this complex and there are walkways between them. There's also communal ground all around the floor units, like ours. The same day these new neighbors move in, their toddlers start riding their plastic bikes up and down the walkway between our units by the window of my office. I go over to the father, introduce myself, welcome the family, and then casually mention that perhaps the kids could use their bikes further away from the units due to noise closer to the actual play area that's set up for the kids. He nonchalantly agrees. I did not meet the mother this day. At that point, the noise levels are somewhat bothersome, but not unbearable. Lockdown hits my country, and soon we're locked down. My partner and I both lecture for a living, and now we do so from home. 
Kids aren't going to school and are home all day. The noise levels become incredibly difficult to ignore, especially when toddlers are running up and down and screaming by my window. As a trustee, I mention this issue to the other trustees. The chairperson denies this issue and points out that kids need to play. Don't get me wrong, I understand that kids need to play, but the amount of screaming suggests something other than playing, and do they have to do it by my window while I'm trying to teach? My classes start finding the noise bothersome. The noise becomes worse. My partner is having an even worse time than I am. It's constant noise and constant screaming. Almost all of the second half of each day. Sometimes the mornings, but it's every day, even over the weekend. We're dealing with the stress of work and lockdown, and the noise is not helping. We start resorting to calling the security guard when things get too bad, just to get the kids to play in a different area. The kids have formed a group from a variety of different units in the complex. They play together every day, but make immense amounts of noise. Sometimes they run or cycle around our unit, and they don't even wear masks. Over the next few months, things start to escalate. The noise never dies down. We often hear kids being loud inside their own unit. The chairperson doesn't care. The managing body doesn't seem to do anything. It feels as though the noise just increases. We are now calling the security regularly. In the grand scheme of things, this is something I confess to. We did call the security often, probably too often, but it was unbearable and they just wouldn't listen. Eventually, the kids learn to hide when the security guard comes and then continue when he leaves. One day, the mother, who I will call Mother A from now on, who moved in next to us comes to see me. She's upset that we are repeatedly calling the security. I explained to her that we don't want to do that, but the noise levels are something we can't deal with. Also, we would appreciate it if they could avoid playing around our unit, which is where the noise is the worst. Things change for a few days and then go back to normal. Now, it's important to note that Mother A is gone for huge chunks of the day, sometimes even leaving one kid to take care of the other. Soon, things are noisy again. There seems to be even more kids. While there are many parents in the complex, there's tension between me and Mother A. There's another mother who lives further away from us. I will call her Mother B. Mother B has two kids, a boy and a girl. The boy is sometimes loud, but it's really no issue. They're pretty well behaved. The girl is quite lovely. My partner likes to garden, and the girl often comes along to learn about plants and partake in the gardening herself. You need to understand, my partner does not like kids, but she befriended this girl through plants and flowers. Sometimes, this girl will come and tell us that the other kids kicked balls into cars, or even damaged cars. We didn't do much with this information, but here is the point to keep in mind for later. This girl liked us a bit. The noise gets worse. I finally write up a formal complaint against my neighbor, all while trying to remain as impartial as I can as a trustee. I'm told that we need proof that the kids are playing or riding their bikes around our unit because, wouldn't you guess, Mother A denies it. My partner catches a few seconds of a kid riding their bike around our unit and we send it along. Things go quiet and a few days later, Mother A comes to see me. She's furious and yells at me for a few minutes straight, accusing me of harassing her kids and telling me that I should just move. I don't get a word in. When she's done yelling, she leaves. Even though the chairperson is stubborn about doing anything, I managed to get approval on sending a notice about noise levels. This is the second notice, but this one is printed and delivered to each unit. The security guard lets me know that when he delivered the note to some of the parents, they crumbled it up and threatened him. Cool. Later in the year, tensions are all over the place. I can't cover every detail, but here are a few. The chairperson keeps butting heads with me on this issue telling me it's not a problem. We get a new neighbor. She's an old lady who has also started to lodge a complaint about the noise. At the other end of the complex, someone else is complaining about the kid's noise. This goes nowhere because the chairperson refuses to acknowledge that it's an issue. We are doing all we can to keep the noise out, whether it be headphones or always keeping our windows closed. The lockdown means we don't get to hold our annual body corporate meeting. We're still calling security. Mother A wakes us up one morning to yell at us again. She's furious that I told her kid not to chase my cat, which he did. Kids seem to know that they frustrate us and occasionally go out of their way to do so, going as far as pretend running across the road when I drive out of the complex. It's 2021. Early in the year, my partner and I have a fight about moving. I'm not ready to give up yet, but she just wants out. She's wanted out for almost an entire year. 
The strain on the relationship is difficult to manage. The chairperson visits one evening, noticing how much noise the kids make and how they're all dangerously playing across the driveways as well. The caretaker tells them to stop and writes up a fine for their parents. We also decide that we should find the parents in the future if they refuse to monitor their kids' behavior. Finally, on the one hand, I think that this is a fairly extreme way to go about it. I've suggested many other possibilities before this which did not resort to fining. On the other hand, I'm relieved that maybe this will get parents to take more responsibility. Boy, was I a fool. Remember Mother B? Well, she's had it, apparently. The next day, the trustees get an email with a signed letter. A lot of things are mentioned. I will paraphrase a few of them. All the parents are sick and tired of being complained about. Their kids need to play outside and socialize, but they're getting herded up and down by security guards from complaints. A certain trustee, they make it clear that it's me, is a horrible person. I am, according to Mother B, video recording everyone, spying on people, harassing them and scaring them. Everything short of calling me a stalker, really. I have done none of these things. I've never even pointed my camera at anyone in the complex. Mother B's kids are terrified of us because we're bad people, despite her daughter gardening with my partner on multiple occasions. I am, according to Mother B, influencing the other trustees to take action against the kids and their parents. Honestly, I wish I could have achieved this. And of course, why am I allowed a cat if it's against the rules? This must be preferential treatment. Remember that meeting about my cat? The rules were never updated to reflect the discussion that took place that evening. Whoops. In fact, a cat enters her unit and has caused something of hers to break. She's pretty sure it's my cat. There's some other stuff, but these are the important points. Almost every parent in the complex has read and signed this letter. Now, I have no proof of this, but I'm pretty sure Mother A had a lot to say in the drafting of this letter. Mother A also thinks that I'm the reason that they're getting fined so the next day she comes to yell at me again. I can't get a word in, so I decide to visit her later. She isn't there, but the father is there. I explained to him that I was not the one who complained. The caretaker was the one who fined the parents. Not only that, but other residents have also complained about the kids. The father was relaxed and eventually relayed the message. That night, Mother A moves on to the older lady next to us to yell at her too. And if you're wondering why Mother A has yet to be confronted or reprimanded for treating the complex like her own prison ward, don't ask me. I've even written a formal complaint about her behavior too. Now, Mother A is friends with her other neighbor. I will call her Neighbor A. Neighbor A doesn't like us because Mother A doesn't like us. And guess what? Neighbor A is now writing complaints about my cat entering her home and that her daughter is allergic. I find it incredibly strange that we've lived next to each other for years and the issue only pops up now. How odd. The chairperson and caretaker contact me. I have to control my cat because it bothers the other units. I'm somewhat baffled. It took almost an entire year to take action against parents, but one complaint about my cat and I need to get my act together. At this point, there's little more to do. Mother B won't stand down. Mother A is ready to kick down the door of anyone who dares complain about her horrible kids. The old lady next to me wants to get out of her contract so that she can move. Kids continue to be noisy. Fines go nowhere. We make the decision. We have to move. Not only is the noise not changing, the parents think I'm a stalker, and now they make up a large portion of complex residents, and now my cat is being dragged into complaints, and who knows if someone might try to hurt her. I can't keep her in 24-7 either. We've tried from the moment we got her, and it drives her insane and unhappy. So, I put the place on the market. It gets picked up by a buyer. The chairperson and caretaker set up a meeting with me, and only me. They aren't happy, and I'm putting them in a bad position by having my cat and constantly pushing the issue with the kids. I explain how I feel about it and voice my own frustrations. They don't acknowledge the discussion we had about pets all those years ago, and it's clear they won't defend me on this. Fine. I then inform them that I'm out anyway. The place is sold and I'm leaving. I'm sure it's what they wanted anyway, so that settles the matter. A few months on and I'm busy packing. I've bought a new home and renovated parts of it. We move in this Saturday and every day kids are screaming outside of my unit. You're hourly. Your day starts at 8 and ends at 5. So I used to work for a large team with like 25 staffers, 6 supervisors, a manager and a director. The manager was a blonde lady in her mid-30s 
whose only discernible qualification was being attractive and in her 30s. She was like Regina George, except she signed your paycheck, so we put up with it. The team was going through a transition from having old-timers retire and hiring new staff, so for like the first year and a half, I don't think we ever left on time. OT was pretty much a given, but towards the end of our second year, my buddy and I, we started the same day, noticed things are slowing down. We're catching up on the workloads and people are starting to leave on time. One day we finish all of our work, help out a few other teammates finish their work, and get pulled into an office with a director to get some praise and recognition. On cloud nine, we get back to our desks, pack up, and leave a few minutes early, feeling good about a solid day's work. We got written up. The next day, we got chewed out by the manager. She reminded us of our start and end time. You're hourly, and your shift starts at 8 and ends at 9. You can't leave early just because you feel like it. We received a lengthy diatribe about being a team player and staying until the work is done, blah, blah, blah. It was unfortunate timing because the reason the director had pulled us into a meeting the day before was to congratulate us on our hard work. Turns out that management had done some metrics testing and figured out that two people on the team of 25 individual contributors were doing about 12% of the total work done each. So the two of us were doing a quarter of the work of the entire team. Our manager had not yet been privy to that knowledge. Armed with the knowledge that everyone was liking their work to last the full day, we decided that for the next month, we would both work at the pace of everyone else. But darn it, we would be at our desks at eight and we wouldn't leave till five. Most days we were done about an hour early and then twiddled our thumbs looking at blank screens from about 4.30 until 5. We even stayed a few minutes past 5. About three weeks in, our manager even commends us on our hard work. About two weeks later, that month's metrics results came in and numbers were down. Turns out, we were now doing about the same as everyone else and the team was not hitting its figures. Our manager had to have known what we were doing, but what was she going to say? They aren't picking up everyone else's slack anymore. So she tries to do us over in another way. I was a few minutes late one day. She wrote me up. Mind you, some of her supervisors would show up late on a daily basis, but I'm an Edmond Dantes kind of guy. I'm cool with that long haul revenge. I started to show up early and would sit at my desk with the computer screen still locked until exactly 8 a.m. And this went on for about a week before the director had had enough and came up to my desk and asked me what the heck I was doing. I explained that my manager wrote me up for leaving a few minutes earlier and wrote me up for being a few minutes late, so I'm just making sure I'm never late as she explained to me that I am hourly and my shift starts at 8. I don't know if he thought the offices were soundproof or just didn't care, but he went off on her and it sounded like we were listening to Beethoven's Ninth, played by the Vienna Philharmonic. Am I the jerk for snapping and leaving my sushi party? I, 25 female, love cooking and having people coming over to eat my meals. However, there's one dish that's always resisted to me, sushi. I could never get it right. And I don't mean like crappy supermarket sushi, I mean restaurant level. This summer, I finally got it and invited family over for a sushi party. Most of my family had never tried sushi before. I asked them to try it and I'd make other Japanese food anyway too. Almost everyone agreed and was eager to try it. Cousin, female, 25, doesn't eat fish, and sister-in-law, 27, doesn't like anything but pizza, meat, and fries. I told cousin I'd include fish-free sushi and other options and make sister-in-law some meat dishes too. They insisted on just having pizza, a barbecue, or something else. I told them sorry, but reason of the family dinner was so they could try my sushi. We could make something different next time. They suggested to bring fries and other non-themed food themselves and I politely said no. It would be all food made by me. I made a huge platter of sushi with and without fish, three types of stuffed pancakes, edamame, salted soybeans, marinated eggplant, chicken and teriyaki sauce. They all knew the menu in advance. It was a success. Some people didn't like some dishes, but that was okay. However, sister-in-law and cousin kept complaining. Sister-in-law kept cleaning the teriyaki sauce from the chicken and complaining that I couldn't have made at least some fries. Cousin said that she couldn't stand the smell of raw fish, didn't smell at all, and that the nori tasted like fish. There were nori-free options. I ignored them until cousin made a joke about all of us getting anisaki 
and sister-in-law followed along telling us to eat more wasabi to get the worm. I snapped at them and asked them why the heck they had agreed to come. They knew the menu and I had been cooking the whole day and prepping the day before. Mom and my brother told me to take it easy. Uncle backed me up and just said to eat what they like and leave the rest. They complained until I had enough and left and cried out of anger. My boyfriend came with me and we returned to clean when they had all left. Mom, brother, and aunt think I overreacted. Uncle and boyfriend think they were being rude. My dad thinks I should have hidden wasabi in their food to keep them busy drinking water. Am I the jerk? Karen loses it at Build-A-Bear. A while ago, I posted a story about my first Karen encounter at Build-A-Bear. For those of you who have never seen or been to a Build-A-Bear, it's the most awesome store in any mall. You pick out an unstuffed friend, fill it up, add extras like a scent or a sound, pick out clothing, name it, and take it home. Now, Build-A-Bear has a ton of licensed products, including the Nightmare Before Christmas. Every year around Halloween, people ask us if we have Jack Skellington or Sally because those are the two bears that get sent to stores. Another thing to note, since lockdown, inventory for our store and all the stores has been weird. Normally, we'd get a truck every single week, but with what's been going on, our schedule has been spotty. Now, when we get our Nightmare Before Christmas items, I notice something. I can't find Sally's dress. In fact, none of us can. Then we realize they didn't send us any of Sally's dresses. We call other stores the same thing. No one in our area has Sally's dress. This isn't usually an issue because kids will dress up their bears in whatever. One kid got a bright pink unicorn and dressed it up as Darth Vader, so Sally doesn't have to have her dress. Well, according to Karen, she had to. It's the weekend, so we were fairly busy. This family comes in with a mom, two grandmas, and two kids. As usual, I think everything is fine until the girl wants Sally. My coworker, we'll call her Ava, is helping them when Karen asks about Sally's dress. Ava explains to her that we don't have Sally's dress in stock, nor do any of the other stores have it. And that is when Karen went from polite to just plain rude. Karen asks Ava why we don't have the dress, and again, Ava explains. Karen still doesn't understand why we didn't have the dress and starts demanding we try to get it for her. Ava, bless her soul, brings Karen over to the computer to show her why we can't just buy the dress. I'm on stuffing duty, and one of the kids, a boy who I'll call Thing One, wants Jack. Again, I think the kid is fine until I realize he doesn't understand the concept of staying in line or going in order. To keep things simple, Builder Bear has an order. You pick out your friend, we ask if you want a sound, then you stuff. The reason for this is that the sound has to go into the bear before we stuff him. Now, I do remember one of my coworkers asking Thing One if he wanted a sound. The sound wasn't in the bear, so I assumed his parents said no. But then he mentions he wants a sound, so I have to get up, get Jack's sound, and then start again. While I'm doing this, the kid is running back and forth to his mom. This kid is like six or seven. He should know better than to run in a store, but whatever. Jack is stuffed, so I give it to the boy to hug. Then I tell him about the hearts. All friends get a felt heart, but you can get special hearts that beat like a real one. Thing one squeezes the special heart and says he wants that one. He begs the two grandmas and then runs over to his mom again. Now had he been the only customer in the store, it'd be fine, but we have a fairly big line and he was making the process longer. Thankfully, Thing One comes back and Karen vetoed the heart, so I finish up the bear. Story over, right? Nope. Karen is furious that we don't have Sally's dress. Keep in mind, Ava has explained to her many times that we cannot order the dress because it's part of the bundle. Karen apparently doesn't care. For the rest of her visit, she keeps making snide comments about the dress. Why don't they have it? It shouldn't be that hard. I wish this store had the dress. Blah, blah, blah. Then, when she comes over with her daughter, Thing 2, they hold up the line even more because they did the same thing Thing 1 did with the sound. And once again, Karen keeps making snide comments about the dress, saying how ridiculous it is that we don't have the dress. Not only was she making these comments, but she didn't smile once as I performed the heart ceremony and continued to talk about the dress throughout the store. When she left, we said, have a good day. She replied with, I doubt it. Karen, please never come back to my Build-A-Bear, and I kind of hope you never find Sally's dress. Have you ever been to Build-A-Bear? If so, what kind of bear did you make? Please let us know. I want a matching Mr. Reddit and Karen bear. That's a really good idea. We should get in touch with them about that. The day I lit an ambulance on fire. 
Several years ago, I was working as an EMT for a small private ambulance company which contracted primarily as a transportation service. The ambulance company employed a pair of mechanics that did regular maintenance on each unit and fixed problems when they came up. The company's CEO was pretty stingy when it came to money, so the rigs were old and a lot of the mechanics' spare time went towards restoring the Impala owned by the CEO's son. I wasn't well liked by the owners and management for one reason or another, but I suspect it's because I frequently spoke my mind. This means that I was tasked with the worst trucks on the worst shifts. One day, my partner and I were dispatched to a scheduled patient transfer from a long-term rehabilitation facility to their home. On our way to the facility, our ambulance overheated and we were forced to pull over. Dispatch was notified and we were told to let them know when the truck cooled so we could get back to work. An hour later, the truck was still hotter than I'd like and I let dispatch know that we needed a new unit. Their solution was to have us drive back and swap our gear into a fresh unit to finish our shift. We would need to drive across town to get back to dispatch, so I let them know that it would take a while as we'd need to pull over every time the engine overheated. Little else was discussed and we started back. I figured I'd stick to the smaller side roads and take my time avoiding the freeways for the safety of ourselves and other drivers sharing the road. I should also mention that every ambulance has a GPS reporting system that reports all of our telemetry, so we're tracked every moment of every day. The moment we pass the first entrance to the freeway, the dispatch manager, we'll call her Mary, calls us on the radio and angrily asks us to explain why we're not following instructions. I opted to give her a phone call to settle this and not have a long drawn out discussion on the public airwaves. Mary accuses my partner and I of wasting time and milking the situation so we wouldn't have to take our share of calls. Mary goes on saying that our intentions were obvious since we're not taking the freeway and as such, when we got back to dispatch, we would be dismissed for the remainder of the day without pay and they would investigate to see if further disciplinary actions would be needed. I tried to let her know that driving on the freeway was unsafe and I would have to stop more frequently, but she wouldn't hear it and told me to get back as fast as possible. No more delays. Cue malicious compliance. Our patient monitoring equipment is incredibly expensive and management has stated in the past that if we break it, we are on the hook to replace it. So I tell my partner to pack it all up and put it just inside the side door because I wasn't sure what would happen, but chances were good that we'd need to grab it quickly and make a run for it. So, as directed, we turn around and head back to the freeway entrance at full speed. I think we made it to the end of the freeway merging lane when the temperature gauge started to redline and we had another 12 miles to go. The further I drove, the hotter the engine got and it started to produce white smoke. Lightly at first, then heavier as we approached the big hill just before our freeway exit. Several cars were passing us and honking their horns to alert us of our peril, but there was no stopping this train. We were filling up the lanes behind us with smoke and the smell was wretched, but the ambulance was still running. As we made it to the top of the hill, the engine cut off and we lost all power. Smoke was pouring out of the sides of the hood, but my vision wasn't compromised, so I coasted it over to the shoulder and got it as far off the road as I could safely manage to. Once I threw it into park, flames erupted from the engine. I told my partner to get as much equipment evacuated as she could and I grabbed the fire extinguisher. As I'm trying to put out the fire, my partner is on the phone, letting dispatch know that we were forced to stop because our ambulance was on its way to a fiery death. I guess at this point our situation had received enough attention that someone had called 911 and the fire department was dispatched, but they pulled up on the opposite side of the freeway watching to make sure that things didn't spiral out of control. We were sure to let dispatch know that the fire department had also arrived. Shortly after our call, the CEO's son showed up in his Impala to pick up the equipment as well as myself and my partner. He was on the phone trying to get a flatbed tow truck out as fast as possible so his smoking ambulance could be removed from the public view as quickly as possible. The unit was picked up and towed back to the garage all while the fire department sat and watched. My partner and I were still sent home for the rest of the day. I celebrated the early start to my weekend with a few drinks and nothing else ever came of it. That unit was retired and never saw service after that, but the mechanics said they owed me a beer. I guess because I brought the end to their worst rig in their fleet and they no longer needed to provide upkeep on it. I told my ex to give me her house or go homeless. I, 36 male, have one kid, Melissa, who is 14, with my ex, Jane, who's 39. We were together for about a year when she got pregnant and expected me to marry her because of it. 
While I did agree that it would be best for us to move in together, I never said that I would marry her and she didn't tell me that she expected me to propose until her final month of pregnancy and she yelled at me for not proposing sooner. Due to the lack of communication and mass assumptions, I set the record straight and said that I wouldn't marry a woman that I've only known for less than two years just because she was having my baby. Cue the flying monkeys that were her parents, friends, etc., saying that I needed to take responsibility and make an honest woman out of her. I countered that if getting married, especially before the baby was born, was so important to her, then she should have picked a different guy. I also pointed out that I was taking responsibility when I moved in, agreed to pay all the bills because Jane didn't want to work while pregnant, attended the majority of doctor's appointments, all the birthing classes, and built the nursery. Jane was so mad that she stormed out and didn't speak to me until after she'd given birth. That ticked me off and I demanded a DNA test before signing the birth certificate and she was so bitter that I wouldn't marry her. By the time Melissa was five, I had already taken Jane to court seven times about custody and visitation. Things got slightly better after Jane started dating again because I would nonchalantly imply that she was still in love with me and her boyfriend didn't respond well to that. She backed off and wouldn't fight me on my scheduled time. Eventually, the guy gave her a ring, but by then, Melissa was enough to be vocal about wanting to spend time with me. While I am glad that Jane found a new guy, this man wasn't exactly a prize and always wanted something for nothing. He wanted to be his own man and own a business and that inherently wasn't bad, but he just was bad at it. When the bank wouldn't give him a loan for his next business venture, he convinced Jane to take a mortgage on her house and it failed. Jane called me claiming to need more money for our daughter's expenses and when I asked her for a detailed report, she got upset and tried to guilt trip me. She said that she would take me to court, but since she had already gotten an increase three months ago, I knew it would be denied. That's when Jane confessed to me about the mortgage and that if I didn't help, Melissa would lose her home. I countered saying that so long as I had a roof, Melissa would never be homeless. Cue the flying monkeys again. Then I told her that I would help with the loan payments after she signed over the house to me. I made this offer knowing that she wouldn't accept it, but prepared to do it because I can say that I tried to help and so that our daughter wouldn't be in danger of losing her home because of her mom's stupid choices again. Am I the jerk? ETA. Because of word count, I didn't initially put this in, but just to be clear. 1. My ex made dumb choices and wants me to bail her out without getting anything in return just because I can and resent her for trying to use our daughter. 2. As stated in the post, my daughter can just live with me if her mom loses the house. I would never leave my own kid homeless. Have no idea where you got that. 3. Yes, the house would be completely in my name and I would sign it over to my daughter once the mortgage is paid off and she's of age. This is being done so her mom can't ransom the house anymore. 4. Yes, technically my ex would become my tenant if she agreed and I would also make her sign an agreement or evict her. 5. After years of manipulation and scheming, I am indifferent to the idea of my ex suffering. 6. Me saying that she still had feelings for me was, admittedly, a tactic to get her boyfriend turned husband to get her to back off because of the constant hassle she gave me just to spend time with my daughter and maintain my legal rights as a parent. Going through the courts is expensive and takes up a lot of time. This was not about ego. Entitled sister wants me to provide for her and her baby. So I, 27 female, moved to the US almost seven years ago. I have two half-sisters from my father's side, all from different women. We used to be very close, and despite both of them being illegitimate, I shared with them part of what little inheritance I got from my grandparents. They never recognized them and left them with nothing. Two years ago, my sisters also moved to the US. My middle sister, 28, let's call her Mary, got a company to host her with a work visa. The eldest, who's 30, Karen, not her real name, got a student visa and moved in with me since I was already working and earning a good salary. The arrangement was that I would pay bills, she would get a job at the university since she's not allowed to work outside and that was her spending money. I would cover all bills and food. The only thing I asked was to help with some minor chores. I have a dog and a cat and I told her she had no responsibility while she had work in school. It was fine since I work from home and I have a step family that helped me maintain my home mostly because I'm the free babysitter for them. Pretty sweet deal for a student, right? Well, apparently that wasn't enough. While she was in school, Karen met Ken. 
I knew Ken from the time I went to university. He's a creep, but I thought he was harmless. Karen was head over heels for him. I warned her Ken had a bad reputation at the university, but she didn't care. She's a big girl, so I let it be, with the only condition that Ken was not allowed in my place. Lockdown hits, and my hours were cut. Karen's school goes on pause, and she loses her campus job. Because of all of this, we moved into a small apartment. I took a second job and did some freelance on the side. Needless to say, I had no personal life. I am dating someone, but he was also swamped with work and bills, so we barely met each other. During this time, Karen and Ken apparently got closer and he began to appear in the apartment. Karen was not part of my lease, but my landlord was very understanding. Ken began making really inappropriate comments about me. I am not a beauty queen. I just look a bit exotic, as Ken put it. I'm mixed and from the Caribbean, so I have a bit of everything, and somehow it all shows. Karen looks more like our father. He was of European descent. In all honesty, Karen is more attractive. I only look foreign in this little intermountain region city. Ken would go out of his way to touch me and was just invasive. I managed to just keep in my room while he was around or use the excuse that my pets needed a walk. I didn't know exactly why, but Karen kept pushing for me to spend time on my own with Ken. It would be good for you to bond with your future brother-in-law. They had only been dating seven months at this point. Whatever, I didn't care. I found excuses to avoid it. November 2020, I got a better position at my main career job, so I was able to quit my second job and have more me time. I reconnected with friends, and one of them asked me if I was okay. I asked why, and he told me Ken had been saying he was very close to getting me for personal time. I was not okay with that idea, and I very loudly said I would rather be hit by a train than doing anything with Ken. Since I'm in a small city in the Inner Mountain region, the kind that most people in the same area know each other, a lot of people had text messages or creepy stories to tell me. That was it for me. I went home and demanded an explanation. They didn't deny it. Ken even said Karen had said it was fine and I was doing them a solid as her sister, since he really had a thing for me. I told them both they were disgusting and that Ken had to leave or I would be calling the cops. Ken left with some insults sent my way and Karen began telling me she didn't see the problem since my partner and I were on a break. We were not. I told her I was not for her to sell around like property and that she had two weeks to find a place for her own. I was done with her. I called all my relatives, sent them copies of the text messages I was given, and no one in our family wanted anything to do with Karen. She moved in with Ken a few days later. It took me some effort, but I was able to get a restraining order for Ken. Couldn't get one for Karen. Still, they disappeared from my radar except for a few encounters which were easily resolved with showing I was about to call 911. And then today happened, and I had to hold back my laughter. Mary had kept tabs on Karen, since sisters and all, and she messaged me with a notice. Hey, Karen just called me. She's pregnant, and Ken kicked her out. I just stared for a few minutes and responded, Oh, that's sad. Mary knew and supports that I don't care or have any intentions to help. Karen used Mary's phone to call me. She begged me to help since Mary is only letting her stay for a week before she moves to another state. Said that she missed her little sister and had no one else to go to. That she knows I have family health insurance. I pay for private health insurance for two relatives that are in hard times and have health conditions and that I should do something like that for her pregnancy bills. This baby is a blessing and I should want to help her raise it. Meaning I pay for everything. I let her pour her heart out for a good five to seven minutes then said, Nope. I ended the call. She tried calling again for a while, then stopped when I got a text message from Mary saying she had left her phone on the counter and she was sorry for the spamming. Most of my family agrees with me, even Karen's mom. The only one that disapproves is Karen's aunt. She's not my aunt, but I called her aunt anyways since I've known her for so many years. She's been putting pressure on me most of the day. She only stopped when I told her one more message and I would show her text messages to my stepfather who is her landlord. I feel bad for the baby to a point, but this is one of those moments that all I can think is this is not my circus and these are not my monkeys. Edit 1. Someone mentioned the region inconsistency. I never looked into it since I didn't really care, but where I live I heard Midwest and Northwest interchangeably. As far as I was concerned, it was the same thing. We don't have that type of region in my country, so I decided to Google while at work and found out neither is right. 
I live in the Inner Mountain region. Thanks, random stranger, for making me check on the messy regional system. Not even Google agrees on it. Also, a small explanation of my grandparents. They were very old traditionalists. By the end of their lives, they didn't have much to give, so they chose to give it to the legal grandchildren. My father had many kids. I might not even know all of them. Grandparents were just tired of every other year having a new grandchild appear and in some cases, a moocher mother attached. Last, Karen's visa. She had an extension since lockdown, but that is over. She's overstaying her visa. This is very common. I have relatives that do it. I don't agree, but I also had one foot in since my stepfather is American. Service dog and the zoo. This happened over five years ago, but I was reminded of it when my oldest was going through pictures. In hindsight, going to the zoo with a service dog was not one of my best ideas, but my kids were still at the age where they liked it. Plus, my friend had her kids for the summer. Spoiler, no one tried to steal my dog. After getting tickets, I'm asked to go to the office so they can notify zoo security that there's a service dog in the zoo and to let me know what areas of the zoo I cannot go in. Basically, I couldn't go into any of the areas where the animals roam freely. Completely understandable. I finish up with the office. We start walking around and one of the first big cats enclosures we see is the jaguar. So beautiful, but I hate how small the enclosure is. I hate the zoo personally. And this is when the entitled parents start. Usually during the day, most of the animals are laying down, but today I brought a dog into the zoo. The jaguar caught the scent of my dog and became extremely restless. The way the enclosure was built, only a chain link fence and three feet separated us. My dog was just sitting next to me with this beautiful and deadly animal staring at us. Because the jaguar was active and close to the fence, people kept coming. Very quickly, I was trapped between the fence and a crowd. I have my dog for mobility and anxiety issues. Getting out of that crowd was difficult. Thankfully, my friend's fiance saw me and pulled me out of there. When my friends saw the crowd building, they grabbed my kids and pulled them away. So that was the jaguar exhibit. Thankfully, the next enclosure was one that I couldn't go in, so I got to sit down for a bit. During this, I had a mom with two kids, young but I don't know how old, demand I go back to the jaguar so her kids could see him up close. I told her no, not happening. She did the whole whining and yelling thing, but at that point, my kids and friends showed up, told her no again and left. She started following us, but it's a zoo, can't tell her where she can't walk as long as she isn't bothering us. Next big enclosure we get to is the wild dogs. This enclosure has viewing glass instead of chain link fencing. They perk up when they catch my dog's scent as well. And again, we draw a crowd. This time, I have a lot of kids pushed up to the front. Guess what? The kids have short attention spans. They saw the wild dogs and then saw my dog. They were more interested in my dog. That exhibit was heck getting out of as I didn't want to hurt any of them. So now, instead of just one annoying mother dragging her kids behind us, we have multiple entitled parents with kids. Every enclosure we see, this crowd would push to get to the front. If I left before one of them got to see the animal, they would demand I go back. Each enclosure, I was losing my grip on my temper. My friends saw this and did their best to try to keep me calm. We're at the tiger exhibit next, and now I'm wondering if the zoo even feeds the animals. The tiger is pacing and staring and gauging distance trying to get to us. After about a minute of that, I couldn't stay there anymore. I was terrified the tiger would try to take the risk and jump. But again, the dang crowd. Now I'd had enough. I ended up telling the crowd to back up and get away from me. These parents got mad at me for the words I used in front of their kids. How could you? Now my revenge. Monkeys do not like dogs at all. They will go nuts if you go near their enclosure. Well, I had this lovely crowd of entitled parents who refused to leave us alone, and we are coming up on some of the monkeys. Once the rest of the crowd caught up, I started going towards the monkey exhibit. My friends took my kids around the enclosure in case I didn't get out fast enough. As soon as I got close, the monkeys started yelling and jumping. The crowd was so excited, the monkeys never jump around. I got to the beginning of the exhibit and rushed through as fast as I could. Limited mobility sucks, but it was the crowd that had feces thrown at them. Afterwards, I was sitting with my kids and friends when one of the women comes up to me yelling about how she never had monkeys throw this at her before and it's all my fault. Her screaming drew the attention of one of the zoo security. After the woman started yelling at him about how awful I was and how she had monkey crap thrown in her hair, that it's my fault. 
He asked me what she meant. I told him about how no matter where we went in the zoo, a crowd followed us and made the whole visit miserable. The woman started yelling that it's my fault for bringing a dog to the zoo, and if I didn't want the attention, then I should have stayed at home. At that point, we were done with the zoo and decided to go get something to eat. This is how I learned that taking a service dog to the zoo is a bad idea. Thankfully, my kids are old enough that if they want to go to the zoo, they can go by themselves. Me and my boy prefer places that have AC. Am I the jerk for saying that my boyfriend had a lifetime commitment to his ex since they are co-parents? My boyfriend used to be married to Jennifer and they have twins. I had never dated a father before, so I really didn't know what to expect. Anyway, my boyfriend and Jennifer are co-parents and split the parenting duties pretty equally. They see each other a lot and communicate a lot about their sons. I realized after we were together for a year that things really weren't working for me. I knew my boyfriend had a commitment from before me to being a father and that would be a lifelong commitment. I felt okay with that and felt like that made him a good dad and a good man. I didn't realize that also meant he'd have, what I see to be, a lifelong commitment to Jennifer. To co-parent, well, they have to communicate often, see each other often, work through disagreements or stressors respectfully, share holidays, stay in touch with each other's families, etc. I felt like those were things I respected him for doing, but I also didn't feel like were what I wanted in a partner. I want a partner who commits to me alone and no other woman, and I want to feel like life decisions are made between me and my partner primarily, not between my partner and his co-parent primarily. I felt like the main relationship and the dynamic was my partner and Jennifer. So I talked to him after about a year, saying that I respected his commitment to his family a lot, but I didn't feel like the relationship was working for me because I couldn't make a life with someone who already had a lifetime commitment with another woman. My boyfriend was really upset with me for saying he had a lifetime commitment to Jennifer, saying they were divorced. I said, maybe not a marriage commitment, but they definitely have a lifetime commitment to raising their kids together. They will always be the parents of two boys who will be in their lives, hopefully for their whole lives. And with that family, they would always have a commitment to their family and to each other. And that I was happy they could do that for their kids' sake, and I respect it, but it wasn't for me. My boyfriend was really angry, saying he never wanted to commit to Jennifer. She pressured him into marriage since she got pregnant young, and she isn't his girlfriend or anything, but the parent of his kids to him, and it's offensive to tell him that he has a lifelong commitment to her. This is where I probably messed up, but I said, but you do, whether you like it or not, you have a family together. He said that he needed some time alone and left for a few days. I feel conflicted. I honestly think that he does have a commitment to Jennifer and I understand and respect that, but I also know he's upset to hear that and to hear that's the reason I don't see a relationship working long term. Am I the jerk for telling my boyfriend he has a commitment to the mother of his kids? Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or not? Please let us know. I don't think she's a jerk at all, but the story still hit me right in the feels. Still a better love story than Twilight. Am I the jerk for ruining my husband's hiking trip? I'm 27, female, and my husband, who's 28, and his four friends, all males between the ages of 27 and 32, have a yearly hiking trip they take for two weeks. They've done it for years, and it's fun for me because I really enjoy being alone, and it's fun for my husband because he gets to hang out with his friends. However, within the past couple of years, the camping trip has always ended in a fight or an argument that kind of ruined the whole thing, but they were hopeful for this year. I will preface this with saying I do not like these friends. These friends are ones he's had since elementary school, and they just have formed a lifelong bond even if they don't like each other anymore. A month before our wedding, three of them decided to take a random trip to Cabo without checking the dates, and the fourth one was having a baby. Obviously, we didn't plan him in the wedding party because of that, but my husband only had one groomsman and no support on his wedding day. They do that kind of crap all the time, where my husband is always kind of left in the dust. They also really don't like me because I helped my husband get sober when we started dating, and they don't like that I took away their real friend. So, on these trips, I always just ask that my husband call or text me when they're winding down at the day, so I know he's alive and well. It doesn't have to be long, it could just be a quick text, but he always calls because, well, I'm his wife and he likes me. These calls never ever last more than 10 minutes, ever. I usually make him hang up to go have fun. His friends apparently hate that he calls me or even texts me on this trip at the end of the night. This came to a point where they hid his phone from him for two days just so he wouldn't call me. 
I thought that something had happened to him and messaged their respective partners, whom I'm actually pretty decent friends with, about if they had heard from them. One girlfriend called and screamed at boyfriend to give him his phone back. When they finally did, my husband called me in near tears, saying that the trip so far had just been a nightmare and he just wanted to come home. He told me they used the trip as an intervention to convince him to divorce me because I am too needy and demand too much from him. Both of those things are severely untrue. I'm not perfect, but I'm certainly not those things. Anyway, this set me off and I messaged their partners about this. I was really upset and wanted to understand what made them do that. Well, apparently I started a whole storm of them all calling their boyfriends and going off on them for me. I didn't ask them to do it and I felt bad because I just needed to vent. This made the trip even worse for my husband because they just kept calling me names. Since being home, my husband is not mad at me at all and understands why I did what I did. He knows they're in the wrong, but now I know I've ruined a relationship he's had for years because I just didn't keep it to myself and I also ruined a two-week trip for him. Am I the jerk? Edit. For clarification purposes, I wanted to emphasize that I'm not asking if I'm the jerk for wanting a text or a short phone call to make sure he's alive. I feel 100% justified in that, and I'm not asking for a judgment call here. I'm asking if I was the jerk for contacting their girlfriends. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the friends? Please let us know. I really hope you're able to keep your husband away from those bozos. Just because you've known someone since you were kids doesn't mean they're your friend. Entitled neighbor caught by his own police call. So a few years back, I, 20 male, had a small two-room flat in a very old building in which you could hear everything. My bedroom was right next to the wall of my neighbor's, 27 male, flat. He was a stupid lunatic who always played video games until 4 or 5 a.m. And he had some kind of problem with losing an MP. So every time he would lose, he would start screaming, throwing things around and punching the wall, waking me up almost every night. At the time, I was doing two jobs and needed every second of sleep I could get. I tried talking to him on several occasions, but nothing helped. One time, when I was out for work, I even let my sound system run a mix of artillery and machine gun barrages just to show him how annoying this stuff could be. But as entitled people are, it didn't do any good. Fast forward a few months and nothing improved, and I was getting crazy about this. One Saturday night, I had a little poker game running in my flat with a few friends, and my neighbor was having one of his usual tantrums. Since I had guests and they didn't like it, we turned up the music. Everybody listened to something different, so there was a good mix of metal, techno, industrial. My neighbor was furious at some point and apparently called the police to file a noise complaint. Luckily, when they pulled up, one of my guys saw them driving up as he was out for a quick cigarette. Now comes the fun. We turned the music down before they came up, so when they rang the doorbell and I opened, they could not hear anything too noisy, just a few guys having some beer and a little poker game. They told us there was a noise complaint from a neighbor saying it was too loud and that this was something constant. We told them we've been like this for hours. Then I had a genius idea. I asked them if my neighbor called them, which of course they couldn't answer, but I knew what was what. So I invited the two cops in and told them I'd show them what real noise disturbance looked like. I led them to my bedroom where one could still hear my neighbor throwing tantrums and I told the cops the whole story. And since they were already here, that I would like to file a noise complaint against him. The cops were shocked at the noise you could hear from the other flat and went directly over to his flat to tell him to shut up and that he would get reprimanded by written letter to keep the noise down and don't call the police for false emergencies. I had a huge laugh as the cops came back to tell me to call them when he did something like this again, because in that case, I would be able to file charges. So, long story short, he thought the police would shut me down. Instead, it was the other way around. I never slept better than that night, and finally I had some peace at home. I hope you enjoyed it. Am I the jerk for kicking my husband out of our kid's room? I'm 36, female, and my 13-year-old son's birthday was last month. I got him an Xbox that he's been wanting for a very long time. He was able to get it after I saved up for it myself since my husband used to call this stuff useless and say we shouldn't spend money on it. My husband liked playing with the Xbox very much. First, he'd play with our son, but now has completely taken over and won't even let our son play with it even for a few hours, not even on the weekends. He's playing most of the time from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m., then sleeps till 12 p.m., spends a few hours visiting gaming stores to buy new games or borrows games from his friends or nephews. 
Then he sits in the living room and starts yelling and cursing and pretends like he's talking to the other players while he's actually talking to the screen. He wouldn't sit at the table to eat and instead eats in front of the screen. He won't sit with the kids and tells them he's busy whenever they ask him to help with homework. I just sit on the couch feeling like I'm not even there while he yells and curses in front of them. When I told him this has been affecting his work because he'd go to sleep at 6 a.m. and wake up at 12 p.m., he asked me what I wanted him to do. Go to sleep at 6 and go to work at 8? He'd call work to tell them he won't come or get someone else to cover for him, even offer them dinner or money, but never really keeps his promise. I was too embarrassed to talk to anyone about this. He is clearly being obsessed. I had an argument with him when he made me lie to his mom, then found out he was at home when I told her he wasn't. He moved into the kid's room so he could focus on playing. The kids wouldn't even be able to sleep because of him being there late at night. Last night, my daughter came to me wanting to sleep in my room, saying she couldn't sleep because her dad was in their room yelling all night. I was so mad at him, especially after I told him to stop because the kids couldn't sleep because of the noise. He kept saying, give me a few minutes, till it was 1.30. I had enough at this point and I unplugged the Xbox and told him he was no longer allowed to do this in the kids' room when the kids needed to sleep so they could concentrate on school. He blew up on me for ruining his game and following him from one room to another and making him miserable. He argued that I have no right to kick him out of his kid's room and called me controlling for how I handled the situation when I've already told him, but he didn't listen. Well, what do you think? Do you agree with OP or her husband? Please let us know. If it were the new PlayStation, I could understand. But Xbox? Bruh. Don't drop too many fries? Sure thing. So right now I'm working in fast food at a certain place with square burgers, making fries and nuggets. Now at said place, it was fine. My coworkers are great, really nice people. They cover me when I clean instead of putting me at the mercy of my managers. Speaking of the managers, they are almost all nice. Notice the almost, it will be important later. Since I'm still in high school and I surprisingly have a life, I'm shocked also. I can only work Saturdays and Sundays, with Saturdays being 5 to 9 and Sundays being a mix between 7 to 3.30 and 8 to 4 respectively. Now, since my football season just ended, I am called in on a Friday. This is before I fully knew the worst manager there. Let's call her Vanessa. So I do what I normally do. Drop the fries, pull them up after the timer goes off, drop them into the fries holder, salt them, and put them in a carton, ready to eat. You're supposed to also use the drop timers, which is supposed to keep track of how long they're sitting there and after a certain set time, you throw them away. I see next to no one do this, so I assumed I shouldn't do it. Well, Vanessa noticed this and began to chew me out because of it, but in a way that was way extra. This got me a bit upset, but I had no choice but to use them. Now, the reason we don't use them is because it slows things down. You're supposed to drop more fries when the timer says no, but this isn't possible during the lunch or dinner rush without causing major overflow. Now, Vanessa tells me to switch out trash cans, so I let the guy on grill, we'll call him Chad, know to keep an eye on it and to use the timer because Vanessa wanted me to. So I switch them out and no later than two minutes after I'm done, she gets up in my face about not dropping it on the timer. I tried to explain to her why this wouldn't work, but she insisted on it. So I used the timers and slowed down production. The rush died down a bit and I still used the timers as I didn't want my head chewed yet again for a third time. Nonetheless, Vanessa found a way to scream at me. She told me to drop less flies, idiot. Now I politely told her that she was the one who told me to drop it on said timer. Now what I said and how I said it didn't show the complete riot going on in my head. I was saying to myself, jerk, you just said to drop more. She screams at me to do it anyway. Cue the malicious compliance. So the rush picks back up and I do not drop a single fry. I take box after box from each and every order until there was enough in there for one more large fry. That's when I dropped the amount for another large fry right then. I also followed the left and right basket rule. No basket of fries from the right to go on the left to really stick it to her. Manager tries to chew me out once again, but I informed her that I was just following her orders. She tries to flip the script, saying she never said that and that she was going to write me up for it. Thankfully, Chad overheard the previous conversations and let her know that yes, she did say that. She tries to put Chad down, telling him to mind his business and threatened him a write-up. Seems like game over for us, right? Except it isn't. Our second savior, the other manager, was working at that point. Let's call him Aaron. 
also overheard the conversation and also let her know that she said that. Now she can't threaten a write-up on someone on the same level as herself, so what does she do? Excuses herself and him to the back, where a glorious shouting match had occurred. We all heard the yells and promptly pulled out our phones. We all see Vanessa storm up here, screaming, Forget you all! and leaves out the front door in front of a crowd full of people, a 2020 crowd as I like to call them, and put the pedal to the metal on her 2005 Honda Civic and that was the last of Vanessa. After the fact, we got a new manager that was leagues better than Vanessa and everything was in balance. And to add salt to her massive wound, I found her recently at another fast food chain where I said to her, don't drop too many fries, lady. Speaking of fast food, what's your favorite fast food place? Please let us know. McDonald's over everything, bruh. My entitled daughter falsely accused our housemate of stealing, so I made her sleep in the backyard. I'm male, 46, and my daughter, who's 16, is a high school junior. I noticed recently that she's been behaving in a bad manner, constantly commenting on other people's looks, belongings, calling them stuff that isn't cool, and just being insensitive. It's like she lost a filter or something, because usually she's polite. But my wife suspected that our daughter's sudden misbehavior occurred after she started hanging out with the new girls from the school. Basically, the mean type, and she's picked up on their behavior. I've sat with my daughter and had many discussions about her behavior and how it's been negatively affecting everyone around her. Our housemate is the person most affected here, and my daughter has chosen her to be her next target for hair, clothes, and etiquette criticism. She has complained about our daughter calling her names like filthy and gross for cleaning certain areas in her house. I took a stand and explicitly told my daughter I'd punish her if she ever said stuff like that to our housemate again. Last week, my daughter had a party to go to. Earlier that day, she called our housemate filthy, so I grounded her by not letting her go to the party. She threw a fit and called our housemaid a liar, saying that she never called her that. That was the end of it. Days later, my daughter came to me saying she couldn't find her iPhone after looking everywhere. She asked me to call her number and I did. My wife and I were stunned to discover that the iPhone was ringing inside our housemaid's bag. I had a confrontation with her immediately and she denied and cried, saying she never touched the phone nor had any idea how it even got there. I noticed my daughter calling her a thief repeatedly, so I told her to stop and go to her room. I checked the indoor camera before continuing the argument and saw my daughter place her iPhone inside our housemaid's bag. I was livid. I apologized to the housemaid and gave her the rest of the day off. I then showed the video to my daughter and she was absolutely speechless. I said what she did was immoral and straight up offensive to tamper with that poor woman's livelihood over a petty party she couldn't go to. I told her she was grounded and will have to spend the night in the backyard. She's a germaphobe. But she cried begging me not to make her sleep with the dirt, insects, and the hot temperature. I refused to discuss it or I'd make it two nights. My wife said I should go easy on her, but I said calling people filthy and accusing them of stealing wasn't okay. In fact, it was the absolute worst. I then went through with my punishment. The reason I chose this punishment was because of the fact that my daughter says she's a germaphobe and uses this as an excuse to insult others' hygiene and appearance. Our backyard has dirt and bugs in it, and this kind of thing gets her uncomfortable, but other than that, the backyard is 100% safe. Question, why doesn't she clean up and do house chores as punishment instead? Because I've already tried this punishment before, and it didn't work because she deliberately stopped eating for days to get out of it, and ended up in the emergency department for low blood pressure. What do you think? Is this punishment too harsh or not? Please let us know. I hope you're able to save her. If she continues this, she'll be like me before you know it. When I was 16, I bought my first car, then my sister wanted it, and my mother was her usual self about it. When I was a teenager, I was originally saving to buy a scooter to have fun riding around town on. But on my 15th birthday, my dad gave me an engine kit for my bicycle and convinced me to get a learner's permit and keep saving to buy a car instead. Even after moving in with my dad, I continued doing odd jobs and earning money any way I could. But my dad asked his brother, my uncle, to teach me to drive because he worked as a driving instructor for a while in the 90s. We started lessons at a local community college where I drove around the parking lots and circled the campus. Then we went to country roads that few cars frequented. This repeated itself for a while till we finally decided to try cities and highways. We took it slow, two days a week, and I slowly got pretty good at it. Right after my 16th birthday rolled around, 
We went to the DMV to schedule a driving test. I passed on my first try thanks to all the practice I got beforehand. Not long after getting my license, my dad decided it was time I worked part-time for him at his business after school. I was happy because it would make me double the money I was already saving from odd jobs. I started at what was referred to as the bottom rung. I was doing the cleaning around the office, filing paperwork, handing out mail to employees, and just doing any basic task that needed doing. Before I knew it, I doubled down my savings. While I had chosen to live with my father and my sister didn't, dad still had a room prepared for my sister when she came to visit. For the first few months or so, sister didn't bother to come visit. But eventually, dad convinced her to come over one day a week on Saturday. And dad always picked her up, so I wouldn't have to see my mom. Thankfully, she didn't really want to see me either. My sister by this point stopped asking me for money or trying to break into my room since I was living in my dad's house and not my mom's. But she loved to game on the game systems we had at dad's house. There was a PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and sister's personal favorite at the time, the Xbox 360. And dad also had a decent sized flat screen TV to play the games on in his den. This was practically a luxury back then, as those TVs were pretty expensive. Sister would pretty much spend all Saturday night playing games in the den and drinking coke. That's probably the main reason why she even wanted to come visit since she didn't have an Xbox 360 or a flat screen TV at mom's house. Eventually, after just over six months of working at my dad's business, he approached me with an offer to find a car I liked. He said if I found a good, reliable, used one that was the right price, he'd help me buy it and would put it on his insurance. I was ecstatic. So I started looking at local ads and found a silver 98 Toyota Camry with under 50,000 miles on it for sale. It was in great shape, save for the fact that the rear bumper had been dented and a few of the windows were broken, along with a badly cracked windshield because it was vandalized by some jerk. The seller offered it to me at $3,500 with the damage, but my dad talked him down to $3,000 because of the money it would cost to get it fixed. I bought the car and it went right to a local auto body mechanic my dad was friends with. He went to a junkyard and pulled parts of another Camry of the same model and used them to fix the Camry I'd bought. And when we went to pick up the car, it looked almost brand new because he'd replaced the broken windows, pulled any dents there were, and touched up and shined the paint with a buffer. I was overjoyed and thanked him and my father profusely. I bought the car, but my dad paid for all the repairs. He never told me how much though, but that car was my main ride for the next 10 years if you can believe it. And I eventually sold it to a cousin on my dad's side for his first car, but that's not what you're here to read. When my sister first saw the car in dad's driveway, she asked whose it was. Sister, hey, whose car is this? Is someone else visiting? Me, nope, that's my car. No way. Yes way, I just bought it and dad helped me get it fixed. It runs like new. Then my sister just got really quiet and went back in the house to play more video games. She didn't really speak to me for the rest of the time she was visiting that week. I started driving the car to and from high school and I got a fair amount of attention for it. Many of my classmates were asking for rides and whatnot, but my ever being a stickler for the rules didn't give any rides because I legally wasn't supposed to for a few months since I was a teen driver. My sister, however, had complained to our mother after going back home about my new car. Somehow, she couldn't process the fact that I'd gotten a car and she didn't, even though she's three years younger than me and was only 13 at the time. She started making a stink to our mom about how she wanted a car too. And mom called me on my cell phone to yell at me for starting this problem. I told her there was no problem. I bought a car with money I earned and now I'm driving it. And if sister wants a car too, then she can either work hard and save up like I did or hope she gets one as a gift. Mom just got mad at me and said it really wasn't fair. I pointed out there really wasn't a fairness issue at all as sister wasn't even old enough to get a learner's permit yet let alone a car. Mom just said I wasn't being supportive of my sister's feelings and that when she is old enough to drive, I should at least lend her the car when she needs it or give her driving lessons. I bluntly said that wasn't happening as I bought it with my own money and it would be put in my name when I turned 18. Plus, she couldn't dictate what I'd do with the car because I didn't live with her anymore and I had no idea what kind of good or bad driver she'd be in a few years. And with her habit of taking my stuff, I wouldn't let her anywhere near my car keys. Mom just angrily huffed, called me a jerk, and hung up on me. I thought that was the end of it, but it wasn't. My sister started visiting less after that, 
She got mad at me one day just for washing my car outside. The following is paraphrased from what I remember. Sister. What are you doing? Me. I'd say it's pretty obvious, but I'm washing my car. Sister. Yeah, I get that you're doing that, but why bother to do it yourself? I mean, you got money. You can just take it through a car wash. Me. And where's the fun in that? At least I don't have to spend $10 to run it through a machine if I just take the time to wash it myself every so often. You're just showing off because you have a car. Me. Showing off to who? You and I are the only ones here. She rolls her eyes. Oh, come on. All my friends keep talking about you and your stupid car. It's not even a cool car. Just a shiny silver piece of junk you think looks nice. And you won't even give me a ride in it yet. Because I'm mandated by law not to have any passengers for several months. And it may be just a Camry, but I like it. And I don't really care what you think about that. My sister then, in a fit of anger, picked up some dirt off the ground and chucked it at the side of my car. But I just sprayed the spot with the hose and it looked like it was never there. So my sister just stomped back in the house and didn't talk to me again. After that, she only came over for one more week again. When she came to visit, she always had a big backpack with her because she'd bring clothes and other stuff in it. She didn't keep many things at dad's house, but the next morning when she left, she was wearing the same clothes, which was unusual because she never did back then. I later found out the reason for this. Next time I went into the den, the PS2, GameCube, and original Xbox were destroyed, and the flat screen TV had part of its screen smashed. The Xbox 360 was also missing. I then realized she'd smuggled it out in her backpack, the other game systems she had smashed and left what remained of them sitting on the TV stand. I checked the various games for the systems and Sister had removed a bunch of the discs from the cases and stolen them as well. And she took all of the memory cards too. When I told Dad, he was pretty mad. He called my mom and she actually said that since I got the car, letting Sis keep the Xbox 360 and the games she stole was the least he could do. Then she smugly said that Sister didn't want to come visit anymore. Dad angrily told her that she better stop sounding so happy about it or he was going to make her pay for all the damages. Mom just snorted and finally allowed him to talk to my sister. My dad was pretty heartbroken sister had done all that. He had been trying so hard to get her to appreciate him more, but sister admitted over the phone that she hated him for divorcing mom. And her taking the Xbox 360 and destroying the TV and other game systems was as our mother called it, compensation for her pain. Dad could have called his lawyer to sue for more custody rights, but he believed that if she didn't want to be there, he wouldn't force her. From then on, over the next decade, I barely saw either my sister or my mother. Dad didn't bother to try and get the Xbox 360 back. He said that it and the other stuff sister broke were just things that could be replaced and bought new ones. But I could tell he was really hurt by what mom and sister had done. He actually left my sister's room pretty much untouched for the next few years, but she never came back to use it. From the way my sister is now though, you'd never guess she was the same person. She's extremely ashamed of her actions back then and wishes she could take it all back and apologize to dad. But she can't since he passed away some time ago. We visited his grave recently and she cried over it. I'm really not sure how to end this story. I don't even have a moral quip or something to say. Moochers parked a trailer against our fence, stole utilities, trespassed, and harassed us. This happened in the mid to late 1980s, so I don't remember all of the details fully. I will do my best to get the details right as well as I can remember. My family moved from the suburbs in California to a rural area in a southern state. We bought a 30 plus acre property with a house for a decent price out in the middle of nowhere. The roads weren't named, the roads weren't paved, no mail delivery, no trash pickup, no city water, no city sewer, etc. We had a landline and electricity. We had a well system set up for water. The system uses our electricity and our setup is old and uses a lot of power. My father was in federal law enforcement and was still trying to find his place and work up a rapport with the local police so he didn't want to start things off by complaining or ruffling feathers. The area is one of those small town places where Yankees were treated with suspicion and they considered California Yankee territory. Our home was outside of the city's jurisdiction, and since there were no named roads and the 911 address system had not been set up yet, it was difficult to explain where we were if we needed to call the police. I can't remember exactly how long we'd been there, but I think it had been maybe a month or two. Our house is on a branch out a long winding road, and there's a dead end. Generally, only people who were completely lost would ever make it out here. The road enters straight in through our front gate, 
and there is a large circular driveway that used to have a 300-year-old oak tree in the middle. The gate is more than 200 feet from our house. The yard was divided into five parts at that time. So one day, early in the morning in summer, I heard banging at the front door. My room was at the front of the house, but the other two bedrooms, including my parents, were at the back of the house. We didn't have a doorbell. I looked out my window and I saw a man at the door holding a very long extension cord extending all the way out beyond my front gate. He was shuffling impatiently and kept banging on the door. I saw him try to open it, but it was locked. I went and got my father and followed him to the door to see what was going on. Dad opened the door and looked out, somewhat annoyed. I think it was a weekend and he worked 60 plus hour weeks and needed his sleep. The guy looked a little puzzled and asked about Joe, the previous owner, being there. My father said, no, he moved. I'm now going to refer to the man as Entitled Man. Entitled Man. Oh, well, I need to hook up my extension cord in the house. Dad, excuse me? Entitled Man. Yeah, we need power for our trailer. Dad looks out and sees a trailer in the fire break parked right up against our fence. Also spots a hose coming from the trailer and hooking up to one of our hose bibs for the front field. Who are you? Entitled Man. I can't remember what he said. Dad, I didn't give you permission to connect to my water and power. Oh, it's fine. We do this every summer. Joe said we're always welcome. Dad, I'm not Joe. He sold the house to us and he never said anything about you or any arrangements. I don't know you and I want you to leave now. Entitled man argued in vain about why he should get to hook up to our utilities. Dad explained he wasn't comfortable with complete strangers parked against our fence. Dude claimed it was public land so he could park there, which was a lie. It was private property. We later found out it was actually on our property, but the fence was in the wrong place, but it would have been Timber Company's land. Ultimately, he refused to move his trailer. Dad, let me walk you out of the yard. Escorted the man to the front gate, shut it behind him, chained it, then turned off the water at the hose bib, disconnected the hose, rolled it up, and passed it over the fence to Entitled Mom. I don't want you coming onto our property again. We don't know you. Entitled Man. You're not very neighborly. You need to learn about Southern hospitality. As an aside, I will interject that the reason my dad picked a place out in the woods was to be away from people and have some privacy. I had followed him out and we walked back in. I looked back to see the guy and his wife and his kid glaring at us. We went inside and locked the doors, front and back. We also went through and made sure to lock all of the windows. Later that day, I went to wash my hands in the sink and the water started sputtering and wouldn't come out properly. From the kitchen window, I could hear one of the pumps, the one that fills our cistern, running like crazy. I unlocked the back door and walked out to the shed with the well and cistern and saw that the float lever was down and the pump was trying to refill it. I went back in, locked the door, and went and told my dad that our cistern was low and the water wasn't working. He checked it too and then went out the front door where he could see that entitled man's hose was in our yard and hooked back up to our hose bib. He sighed and went back out to the shed and shut off the water to the front yard. We then waited for the cistern to fill enough for us to use it. We figured that entitled man would get the message and go away. Nope. Next thing we know, there's a loud, angry banging on our front door. I looked out and then saw Entitled Man all red-faced and seething. I got Dad's attention again and he went to the door with me. Dad unlocks and opens the front door. Entitled Man screams, The water isn't working! Dad, sternly. I noticed. I told you not to connect to our utilities and you did so anyway. You drained our cistern. I also told you to leave and locked my gate. You are trespassing. Leave now. You've already left us without power. What are we supposed to do without power? Leave. Dad stepped out and escorted him to the gate again. Opened it for him, let him out, closed it behind him and chained it. You are not welcome here. Do not set foot on my property again. I can't remember if it was that day or the next day. It's been too long and I can't remember how long this lasted, but I think it was a week. But the phone started ringing off the hook and we kept having people ask for an entitled man or his wife. Now, we had an unlisted phone number. It was unlisted for a reason. We have no idea how they got our number. When these people called, we just told them they had the wrong number. Around afternoon, Entitled Man's wife, we'll call her, Karen, came knocking on the door. I saw it was a lady, so I went to the window and asked her what she wanted. She demanded that I open the door to let her use the phone. If she had asked nicely, I might have asked my parents if it was okay to let her in, but she was rude, so I was defensive. 
I essentially told her to buzz off. She started banging on the window and screaming at me. This got my mom's attention. Mom, don't you use that kind of language at my house? Mom doesn't like it when people use words like that. Karen, I need to use the phone and collect my messages. Mom, what messages? Karen, we gave people the number so they can call us here. Dad, who walked in on the conversation at the window. Who gave you the number? Karen refused to answer, but demanded we give her the messages and let her inside. Mom, we are not your answering service, and I am certainly not letting you inside my house. Now get off of our property and do not come back. Karen angrily shouted about what horrible people we were and how we were going to heck. I snuck outside via the back door and followed her at a distance to make sure she left and chained the gate behind her, and I think I stuck my tongue out at them. At some point, we went into town to visit some elderly friends of ours that had somewhat adopted us when we moved there. We were gone a few hours. When we returned, I got out and unchained the gate so Dad could drive through, then shut the gate and chained it again, then skipped all the way to the house trying to race the vehicle. I was also the remote control for the TV back then. Parents said what station to turn it to and I would turn the dial. Before we got into the house, we heard some angry shouting. Entitled man and his wife undid the chain and were storming toward us, screaming and generally cursing at us. Dad, what is your problem? Entitled man, you locked your doors. Karen, and your windows. We couldn't get inside. Mom and dad, of course we did. Mom, that was the point. We don't want you inside of our house. We don't want you here at all. Entitled man, you are terrible hosts. Dad, you were not invited here. You are not welcome here. Now leave. Again, he escorted them to the front gate. This time, he had a shiny new padlock that we had grabbed at the store. He put it on and told them in no uncertain terms that they were not allowed to trespass on our property for any reason again. If they were unhappy with the accommodations or lack thereof, they were free to leave. A few days later, early in the morning, as my father was getting ready to leave for work, we heard pounding on the door again. I alerted him as he was putting on his gun holster for work and said it was entitled man and his wife again. He clipped his badge onto his belt where it would be visible and went to the door. Being the pest that I was, I opened the door and raspberried them as they screamed and yelled about how we were horrible people, we ruined their vacation, and that next year we better get our act together or there would be heck to pay. At this point, I stepped aside so my father could step out with his service weapon and badge visible. They both suddenly got quiet. Dad, how did you get into my yard with a locked gate? They stare in silence. Me. I think they climbed over the gate. It's sagging. They had actually messed up the gate by climbing over it to trespass. Dad, you are trespassing. You are going to leave my property now. To me. Get the key. Me. I ran off and grabbed the key to the padlock. I'll put them out. I then ran circles around them sticking my tongue out and upsetting them even more, but they were too afraid to say much to me. I zipped ahead of them, unlocked the gate, dragged it open, and told them to get out and stay out. I may have stuck my thumbs in my ears and wiggled my fingers while saying, nee, 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 nee. I slammed the gate behind them and padlocked the chain again. They angrily left, but not before banging their trailer into our gate and laying on the horn for a couple minutes before they finally left. That weekend, my dad had me help them collect branches, old fencing material. He made sure I didn't touch the barbed wire, but he picked it up, etc., and showed me how to build a barricade, just the way he learned in the army. Did I mention he was also a Vietnam veteran? We built it a few feet from the road so it would block anyone from trying to drive in and park at the fire break. The other side had a power pole in the way so no one could get a vehicle through there. The next summer we were awoken to angry horn honking, pounding on the door and shouting. I looked out to see a truck with a trailer in our driveway. The gate, which had still been padlocked and chained, was open. Karen was in the passenger seat hitting the horn, an entitled man was at the door. I went to get my father and told him the jerks with the trailer were back and they somehow opened our gate. He got up and went to the door. Before he could even speak, Entitled Man was shouting at him. There's a bunch of branches and stuff piled up near the road. Dad. So? We can't get in to park our trailer. Dad. Good. You won't think that when I burn your house down. Dad, in a low quiet tone that used to scare the crap out of people. Are you threatening a law enforcement agent? I don't remember the response, but he followed with, It would be a shame if I had to call my friend Sheriff Turner to have you arrested. By this point, he had developed a very good rapport with the police. Forget you! Dad, 
That's nice. Now get off my property and don't ever come back, or I will have you arrested. While the conversation was happening, I got some paper and pencil and wrote down the license plate number of the truck and the trailer. No, I don't still have it. I handed it to my father and said we could give that to the police. Entitled man angrily got in his truck, pounded on the horn a few times, and drove off in a huff. We never saw him again. We found he had cut the chain on our fence to get in. Dad called the sheriff and gave him a heads up about what happened and gave out the license plate numbers and description of the vehicles just in case there were any problems in the future. They may or may not have been pulled over and ticketed in just about every town in the county. Never found out who gave them our number. Could have been Joe. Don't know if he had our number. Coming from Cali, where home defense laws were different, we hadn't yet familiarized ourselves with the laws, and this was before the Castle Doctrine laws. But brandishing a weapon was not advised in Cali. Dad saw enough violence in Nam that he didn't want to encourage more. Entitled Man was armed, but didn't ever brandish his weapons with us. He was there to hunt and fish. We didn't know who they were friends or kin with, so we didn't want to risk agitating locals and finding out they were best buds or cousins with the sheriff. Dad didn't want to come off as a whiny, complaining Yankee that upset the local law enforcement. Also, he did not have jurisdiction over U.S. citizens. He needed to have cooperation from local cops, and with the good old boys club thing they had going on, he didn't want to run afoul of them and deal with resistance and problems. We didn't want any of the locals coming at us for revenge. We did later get big dogs, but they don't always deter people. It was a complicated situation, and Dad just wanted to de-escalate rather than aggravate and cause problems. If they had started this crap a year later instead of that first year when we were still settling in, he would have called the sheriff right away and some large deputies would have come down and told them to get lost. Extra cheese? You got it. I work at a fairly popular buffet-style pizza place where you can request any order with any toppings and we'll put it on the line. This means I, as the cook, am very used to getting strange, gross, and annoying pizza requests. This was different though. We have multiple specialty sauces that we can use for the pizzas, including an Alfredo one. Now, for those of you who don't know, cheese sauce plus normal cheese plus oven equals soup. I was always told to be very careful with how much cheese I add to an Alfredo pizza, because even a little too much can make it basically inedible. This particular day, I had a customer come in requesting an Alfredo pizza with extra cheese. No problem, I add more than normal, but still not enough to make it soupy, and throw it in the oven. It goes up on the line, and without even taking a slice, the customer tells me there isn't enough cheese. I try explaining that adding any more would make it so soggy you can't even lift a slice, but they were having none of it, and very angrily demanded I make them a new one. And do it right this time. I don't have all day. It's pizza, bro. Chill. We were fairly slow at this point, and I had done all the to-go orders I needed to complete, so cue malicious compliance. I told our server that there would be a special pizza coming out, and I wanted to deliver it myself. She's confused, but basically just says, do what you want. I go to my station, put on the sauce, and absolutely destroy the thing with cheese. It looked like a snowy mountain peak. Beautiful, terrifying, and probably very detrimental to our food sales costs. Oh well. The pizza comes out, and it's more liquid than solid, but I managed to cut and plate it with minimal losses. I bring the entire tray to his table and set it down. A huge smile on my face. Mr. Huffy still looks angry and exclaims the usual, Finally! And I walk behind the counter to watch. It was even better than I'd hoped. As soon as he picked up the slice, one-handed, a rookie mistake, an avalanche of hot cheese sauce spilled down the front of his shirt. He starts yelling and manages to smack his hand down on the tray, flipping it and further covering himself in chunky hot nastiness. My server and I are laughing so hard we need to go into the walk-in so other customers won't hear us. He never came in again. And yes, I cleaned the table afterwards. Our janitor was a sweet old man and it wouldn't have been fair to leave it for him. Am I the jerk for removing the wood my neighbor keeps putting on my fence? We recently got a dog. He's a friendly dog and very well trained. He used to be a competition dog but got retired due to an injury that caused cosmetic damage to his face. Now along with his size and scarring, he can look pretty intimidating. Now to keep him satisfied and happy, we got a whole doggy gym set up so he could continue doing his various agility activities including some jump bars. One of the first times I was out in the back having him do some agility practice, my neighbor's son was out in their backyard. He came over to my fence to watch and we got to talking about him. He was impressed when my dog easily made it over the higher jumps. 
I made a quick comment about how it was nothing to him, and he could probably jump over the fence if he wanted to. Well, he told his sister, who was apparently already scared of my dog due to his appearance and a bad experience with another dog. She's been refusing to come out into their backyard to play because of my dog. We tried introducing my dog to her so she could see that he was actually really friendly and well-trained so he wouldn't just jump over and attack her. She was not having it though. So my neighbor has been putting up tarps and tried to attach plywood with some straps to the top of my fence so she would be less scared and won't see my dog. Now, my fence, which is solely owned by me and just on my property, is a beautiful decorative wrought iron fence that came with our Victorian style house and all the stuff he put on it looks tacky as heck. So I took it all down and put the stuff in a neat pile next to his house. He put it all back up while I was gone. While I was taking it down again, he came home so I went over to talk to him about it. He got angry at me for taking it down and said he had to do it to protect his daughter and to keep her feeling safe. He said if I wanted to look nice, I should build a taller fence that wasn't see-through since I was the one that decided to get the dog. I told him I wasn't replacing the fence and that he could build his own fence on his property if he wanted to, but to keep stuff off mine. Then he said I was a jerk for thinking he should pay for another expense when I was the one that got the dog and he had recently been laid off, which is something I knew because we talked about it before. Also because it would be really easy for me to build one or put in some cheap hedges since my yard is just grass and his is all paved over. I don't want hedges taking up space in my yard or a different fence though. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.